Hi, everyone. Welcome to our graduate symposium for this academic year. Last year, we had we held our symposium under very different circumstances. We met at the Joukowsky Forum at um, the Watson Institute. We were all in the same room. We had food. Um, unfortunately, we are not able to do that this year, but it's great to be able to meet even virtually. My name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown. And I am very grateful to our affiliated students for taking the time out of what I know is a busy schedule preparing for exams, some of you are meeting thesis related deadlines, but this symposium couldn't happen without you taking the time to share your work with us. I also wish to acknowledge your departments and your supervisors who are central players in your academic life and to thank them for sharing you with the rest of um, the CACS community. I want to thank the panelists today, our panelists and our chairs, whom I'll introduce shortly. I also want to thank Ailton Barbosa and Kate Goldman from CLACS, the members of the, the Watson communication team, especially Ellen and Alex, for helping us to make this possible, and to thank you, the audience, for coming out in what I know is a particularly busy semester. I'll start by introducing, um, no, before I introduce Jill, a few housekeeping matters. The pan, we, we are organized into two panels today. The first one um, starts soon and finishes at 2.30. The second one begins right after and finishes around 3.30. We, are inviting you to share your questions in the Q&A function. Please don't wait until the presentations are over to start you know, raising your questions. You can raise them at any point throughout. We'll get to them though, once all the presenters have spoken. I, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the first panel, Jill Kuhnheim, who is a visiting scholar at Brown. Professor Kuhnheim was previously a visiting professor in the Hispanic Studies Department here for five years. Her areas of interest include contemporary Latin American literature, particularly poetry, gender and feminist studies, and healthcare humanities in a Latin American context. She came to Brown from a tenured position at the University of Kansas, accompanying her partner who works in the School of Public Health here. Um, thank you, Jill. I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Patsy. I had to get myself unmuted there. I just wanted to add, Patsy mentioned we'll have the questions in the Q&A function. If you could make it clear to whom you're directing your questions, because we'll take them at the end. So if you want to ask all the panelists or a particular panelist, um, please try to make that clear in your question written into the Q&A. So each panelist today will speak about 15 minutes. Um, the good thing about having to write out your questions in the Q&A is that you'll, sometimes what happens in these panels in my experience is that everybody forgets who, who spoke first and a lot of questions go to the last speaker. So hopefully we'll be able to spread them out this way. Um, our first speaker today is Regina Peak, who is a PhD student in Hispanic studies here at Brown. Uh, she is from uh, Mexico City, she's Chilanga then. She studied at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México at Harvard and at Boston College. Her interests include 20th century and contemporary Latin American literature, both fiction and poetry. I'm so glad you included poetry in there too. Uh, the literature and cinema of the Mexican Revolution, Borderlands and Literary Theory. Regina's title today is Throw Daughter In, Then Jump In After Her, Motherhood as an Environmental Paradox. So, Gracias, Jill. Uh, well, thank you so much to Patsy, Kate, Ellen, uh, Alex, and everyone at CLAX for organizing this and for having me here. I'm excited to see you all in person again sometime soon. Um, I'm going to share my screen. All right, we're going to go with this way. Um, so, as uh, Jill said, my presentation is called 
throw daughter in, then jump in after her. Motherhood as an environmental paradox. Um, so water and mother or motherhood are terms that we associate with life and life giving. In contemporary times or since the beginning of the Anthropocene, however, the safety of things as simple as water or air, uh, for that matter, like we all know recently, have become questionable. Um, water has become polluted with toxins such as heavy metals and chemicals like lead, mercury, and arsenic, which, sorry, uh, which in turn have affected both human and non-human bodies. The work I present here is part of, part of a larger study, um, which is a work in progress um, about motherhood, grief, and water toxicity, um, which reveal that the, the dissolving properties of water and their proximity and exposure to toxic substances have a physiologically and conceptually disturbing effect on the mother's naturalized roles as caretakers, food providers, and protectors of their children. Today, I will discuss a poem by Maria Melendez. Oh, there it is, Maria Melendez. Um, a contemporary Chicana eco-poet from California called Llorona's Guide to Baptism. From her first collection, How Long She Lasts in This World from 2006, about a suffering mother, a metallic creek with mercury storing fish and the loss of her child to contaminated water. Uh, the poetic voice in Melendez's poem uh, compares giving her daughter water to drink from a, a natural water source to the contradictory act of throwing her daughter into a river to drown her and then jumping in after her to save her, like my title. With this, Melendez illustrates what I call motherhood as an environmental paradox. A mother, while caring for her child, while nurturing and procuring her the means for her sustenance, is causing her death. And if she stops giving her water, the girl will die as well, and perhaps even faster. Cases like this one abound in the real world. We need only need to uh, look at the water crisis unveiled in Flint, Michigan in 2014. The environmental paradox in this poem extends beyond the focus of the child's well-being. I claim that this poem also pays attention to the degradation of the mother's health as a consequence of her naturalized role of food provider and water provisioner. The mother is equally affected and changed by her proximity with the toxins present in the creek water. I wish to argue that while the mother keeps acting in mostly the same ways as before or as usual, the toxicity present in the water she drinks and thus in her body changes um, the meaning of her mothering. The interabsorption of toxic water in the mother's body undoes the acts of mothering creating the idea of what I call toxic motherhood and dissolving the blame of environmental degradation and water toxicity. Um, I follow culture, cultural studies scholar Mel Chen on their theorization of toxicity. So when we discuss toxic motherhood, we fall under the scope of what this author ident identifies as the metaphoric use of the term toxicity. This use of toxicity, Chen notes, has political implications. The person or group that we define as the toxic irritant, that's a quote from him, her, them, um, in our case, the mother, and I quote, coincides with habitual scapegoats, scapegoats of ableist, sexist, and racist systems. Toxicity's first under threat and second threatening bodies are thus in the eye of the beholder, end of quote. So this holds true in our case of toxic motherhood. The child as the first body under the threat of toxicity and the second and threatening body of the mother are what constitute the idea of toxic motherhood and place the blame of the child dying as the mother's responsibility. It is her responsibility to nurture and protect. It is her failure when her body cannot protect her daughter from surviving the toxicity that she is herself subject to or it is her responsibility that her child is affected by the water, which she did not contaminate. The metaphor of toxicity places an undue and heavy burden on mothers for the intoxication of their children and directs the attention away from the causes of the toxicity of water. Like Chen points out, mother be mothers become the scapegoats of a larger system of water and environmental pollution 
that is not willing to take responsibility for it or worse, to stop causing it. Additionally, the toxicity of the mother does not appear at first glance to be evident or even central to the poem. But a closer reading shows that it is as much about the toxicity of the poem is as much about the toxicity of the mother as it is about the loss of the daughter and the mother's grief. In the single verse, third stanza, which you can see here, the poem's poetic voice tells the mother, as an aside, cough and wheeze your way into each day. The parenthetical recourse here is suspicious. It seems as though mentioning that the mother is coughing and wheezing, evidence that she has been affected by the toxins in the water is unimportant. It reads as if it were an interruption to the rest of the poem, but it is only a reenactment of the reality of a mother's life. Her health does not come second, does not only come second to her children, but it is a parenthesis in her own life and in the life of the family or society. It exists, but it is superfluous information that could be left out in the sentence and, and it would still be syntactically complete. The family would remain as though nothing was wrong. A parenthetical clause in a sentence is usually one that not everybody has time to read and most skip in a haste. Like a parenthetical, the health of a mother is a bother and takes up unnecessary space in a patriarchal family discourse. By formally reproducing this act of leaving the mother out, Melendez is criticizing it and pointing out the failure of societies to care for mothers. The notion of toxic motherhood, however, can potentially have a positive side. Chen explains that proximity to the notion of toxicity brings with it a sense of negativity that we've talked about, like the infected body is bad, it should be rejected, expelled, and isolated. But they also suggest, an, and I quote, uptake of the toxic, inspired by queer theory, in the sense that the toxicity of human bodies could be seen in a positive light to make an intervention in the world. Chen suggests that what or who has been infected and ostracized through the vision of the uptake takes and takes, and I quote, the power to turn on a lens on the anxieties that produce it and allow for a queer knowledge production that gives some means for structural remedy while not abandoning a claim to being just a little bit off. In this sense, the notion of toxic mothers in society should take, take on an unsettling effect. They should be an uncomfortable and threatening image. In the poem that I read here, the figure of the mother continues to fulfill a founding or primordial fun function of care and survival. Thus, discussing the toxicity in the mother's body, my attempt is to complicate the naturalization of the role of the mother as caretaker, as well as to show its potential environmental peril. By reframing the figure of La Llorona, the, an the antithesis of a good mother, in the context of contemporary environmental degradation, Melendez aims to destabilize the notion of a mother as a natural caretaker and food provider. There are many versions of the legend of La Llorona in Mexican and Chican Chicanex folklore, but the common elements are that she is the restless spirit of a woman who commits suicide after killing her own children, usually by drowning, and her spirit is destined to walk around wailing forever for her loss. For her loss. Sorry, I Um, the story dates back to pre-colonial times, and the first written version dates back to the year 1555 in the Florentine Codex, compiled by Friar Bernardino de Sagun. According to the information the friar gathered, before the Spaniards arrived to the Americas, a woman could be heard crying and screaming an, ar around at night, saying, my dear children, we must soon go far away, and my dear children, where shall I take you? This appears in uh, Leon Portilla, um, Vision de los Vencidos. Um, this apparition refers to Siwakoatl, meaning the woman who cries in Nahuatl language, one of the oldest ant antecedents of La Llorona. According to the informants of Friar Bernardino de Sagún, La Llorona was a sign of bad things coming. This has been interpreted as a prophecy of the arrival of the Spanish to the Americas and the overthrow of Aztec rule. Of life, of life as it was known until then. But moreover, it was an omen for the advent of colonialism and the beginning of the Anthropocene. 
which arguably began in 1492. Then, if for the legendary La Llorona, killing her children was in some way, in some, in some fashion, a way to protect them from the terrors and perils that would, would arrive with colonialism, in Melendez's poem, the poetic voice makes the reason for the daughter's death explicit. It is polluted water that will kill the girl, one that her mother knowingly gives her. It is a baptism that instead of saving her, condemns her. The mother's first mandate, caretaking and ensuring her child's survival is not only violated, but becomes impossible. Nonetheless, the mother's feeling of guilt and the poetic voice emphasize the trust the child places in the mother and that she betrays. I'm quoting what you're seeing. Um, Wander in the valley and wail for her plump forearms and wrists. The safety of the fur she thinks she's grabbing in that fit. For the mother, wailing becomes both a form of expression and her grief, a form of remembrance. Gloria Ansaldúa, when discussing the act of wailing in the legend of La Llorona, notes that the, and I quote, the Indian woman's only means of protest was wailing, end of quote. This understanding of wailing is echoed by Fred Moulton's suggestion on the importance of moaning as, I quote, an augmentation of mourning end of quote, when facing ineffable pain and violent acts that must be refused. This understanding of wailing as protest and refusal takes on very interesting, a very interesting meaning in the context in which Melendez writes, which is as a Chicana in the United States, just like Ansaldua. Chicanas and Chicanos continue to be a marginalized group within, with limited access to shifting public conversations about the, the environment especially women experience worse environmental conditions than men because the roles of caretaking, health care providing and food provisioning, which include domestic water provision and management, bring them into, um, and I, I'm quoting, daily and direct contact with environmental pollution, according to social scientist Stephanie Buechler. In this sense, whaling can be understood in this poem as a form of protest to bring attention to to bring attention to these ecological concerns. Buechler says that, I quote, in particular in the US Southwest border region where large populations of Chicanos and Chicanas live, ecological concerns linked to the global change are often under publicized by the media when there are political concerns related to immigration, border security and drug violence in the same areas, end of quote. One can imagine that attention paid to the political concerns that Buechler mentions and away from the more dangerous environmental concerns that affect this population stems from racist prejudices. Wailing, therefore, remains an important form of protest brought to light by Melendez. This poem does offer a vision of the future. For the failed baptism, the guide requests a mammoth task, as you see in the first stanza. As I see it, this dusk is a two-way portal in time. One side of the portal takes La Llorona to the ancient past, to a time before humans made their mark in this world and had not yet started to damage the, envir the environment. But on the other side of the portal, the tusk, as um, Chicano scholar Randy Antiveros proposes, can, uh, and I quote, can be a reminder that another world has existed and will exist, end of quote. It opens the possibility of a future free of toxicity in which women have a stronger influence in the ways of the world and humans in interconnectedness with nature, which will hopefully not be through toxicity and environmental damage. Wailing as a means of pro protest and refusal and the hidden heavy task as a symbol of a veiled threat and an enormous responsibility emerge as resources that women have against toxicity and environmental degradation. And also as alternatives to move towards that otherworldly and better future they will start anew. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Um, we'll, again, if you have questions, make it clear that who, you, who you're directing your question and we'll have the questions come up at the end. Um, 
Our next uh, presenter is Watufani Po, who is in the PhD program in Africana Studies here at Brown. He earned his BA from Swarthmore College in Africana Studies with a minor in Latin American Studies. Uh, Watufani spent two years in the San Francisco Bay Area as an AmeriCorps member working with various LGBTQ activist organizations whose main goals were to educate and promote youth activism, especially among youth of color. His research interests include the African diaspora in Latin America, Brazil's black social and political movements, black queer theory, black transnationalism, and intersectionality. Today, the, uh, his talk is entitled Black Queer Freedom, the Radical Imaginings of Black LGBTQ plus people. It's your, it's your turn, Watufani. Great, thank you for that introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen real quickly. So thank you so much for everyone in Clax for organizing this symposium. It's, you know, after being away from Brown for so long doing ethnographic research, and now with the pandemic, it's, it's, it's been too long. And so it's nice to be able to finally connect virtually um, with the Brown academic community. My talk today is entitled Black Queer Freedom, the Radical Imaginings of Black LGBTQ People in Brazil and the United States. Queer of Color critique scholar, Jose Munoz, and his seminal work, Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity, argues that queerness, especially as invoked by queer people of color, only exists fully in another time beyond the present. Through the violences of the systems of power that render impossible an unbounded existence for queer people to exist freely, queer people must exist within a futuristic state Munoz explains, quote, we have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. The future is queerness, queerness's domain. Queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. The here and now is a prison house, end quote. Munoz's metaphorical explanation of the temporal space that queer people occupy illuminates the work required for queer people, particularly black queer and trans people, to find the tools to simply exist. Black LGBTQ people's navigation of violent forces of oppression that act as controlling forces in their lives necessitates, as Munoz would argue, their mental ability to create a temporal shift. If freedom for Black LGBTQ people exists only in the future, they must be able to time travel, manifesting that futurity of freedom in the now. For Black LGBTQ people who constantly navigate white supremacy, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy in the present, what does manifesting that futurity of freedom look like in practice? What are the ideas they are working towards and how do they manifest these ideas? This presentation takes up the question of Black LGBTQ freedom for activists in Brazil and the United States. In, this, in, in the dissertation chapter this presentation is based upon, I focus on four different themes of Black LGBTQ freedom apparent in my interviews with more than 60 Black LGBTQ activists across both country, countries. In this presentation adapted from that chapter, I focus on one salient theme, the freedom to exist and how Black LGBTQ artists from Brazil and the United States manifest this theme in their art. After the release of her 2010 critically acclaimed uh, album, The Arachnoid, Kansas City native Janelle Monet confused many by always maintaining her public image in a clean tuxedo. While topping the charts with hits such as Tightrope, she maintained her tuxedoed appearance. She seemed to ignore the pressures of a music industry that insisted Black women need to conform to a hyper-feminine catered look to achieve success within the music industry. Looking back on these early pressures, she spoke to the, to, on these early pressures, she spoke to these pressures in an interview in 2019 saying, quote, when I began touring, stylists would tell me to dress more feminine. And that's the reason I stayed in my tuxedo so long, out of rebellion. I wanted to prove that I can make it by, by being my authentic self. It was about proving that as women, we can wear tuxedos, we can wear dresses, we can show skin or not show skin. 
but we need to be in control of that, end quote. Monet's insistence on self-definition and control over her own image is exactly the kind of temporal shift that my Black LGBTQ activist interlocutors invoke when, refer when referring to the theme of self-determination and the freedom to be. However, rather than accept Janelle Monet's futuristic defiance to gendered norms, people spread rumors about the reasons why she insisted on masculine styles of tuxedos. Monet drew upon these rumors to preach a bold, albeit coded, celebrated celebration of Black women's sexual freedom and autonomy around the release of her second album, The Electric Lady, in 2013. Her norm-defying gender presentation and lyrics led many to believe that she was using the album as a subtle way to come out as lesbian, bisexual, or queer. But instead of leaning into these terms, she began to define herself differently, stating in a 2014 interview with The Guardian, quote, I am part android, I am the electric lady. Have you listened to my album, The Electric Lady? End quote. Monet's response, while also play, playfully gesturing to the title of her latest album and her long Afrofuturistic identification with androids, again takes back Monet's agency and self-definition with the context of the terms and philosophies that she had presented since her arrival as an artist on the music scene. While Monet would later come out, come out in her own words as queer and pansexual in 2018, her gender norm defying reflects the self-determination and manifestation of a black queer freedom she infuses into her artistic persona. I'm going to pay, play a quick, uh, a quick clip from Janelle Monae's music video, Queen, and then talk a little bit about how Monet brings forth these futuristic ideas of black queer freedom in this clip. I love this clip, but for the sake of time, let's move a little forward and talk about what's here in the clip. So Janelle's, Janelle Monet's music video, Queen, already uh, Monet sets her music video up as an artistic rendering of a freer Black future. As the video progresses, Monet in her signature tuxedo and her music team are woven from the, the from, are, are woken from their frozen slumber and begin to dance and vibe to the music. Monet switches in and out of her signature tuxedo into the striped black and white tight-fitting dresses that her crew of Black women backup dancers are wearing, almost as if trying, to, trying out different forms of gender expression. After Monet's first, terrain, first refrain, quote, am I a freak for getting down? She appears to, to repeat the title of her song, Queen, again. Yet this time, she curiously leaves out the end of the word. She leaves the end of the word open leaving the faint sound of queer instead of queen. Let me see if I can find that in this clip for you all here. As, as her refrain, so this opening at the end of queen that sounds a lot like queer suggests many meanings, odd, strange, or even queer in the meaning of non-heteronormative. Monet's consistent questioning of whether getting down or dancing, living, or being free in one's erotic self makes her a freak. Juxtaposed with her invocation of queer suggests that she is calling attention to the way black women's gendered and sexual choices are extremely controlled. And that to step into the free and complex fullness of those choices is to step into a queerness. <laughs> Later on in the song, her repeated refrain extends, and the lyrics are right here on the slide. Instead of allowing herself to be controlled by the multiple systems of power that seek to control Black women's expressions and self-making, Monet's lyrics suggest a leaning into what Audre Lorde calls an erotic power. And Monet's lyrical insistence on both a freedom to be in all of her complexities, that ending line, even if it makes others uncomfortable, I will love who I am. So the, the insistence to, to, on a freedom to be and the self-determination, she insists that regardless of external pressure, pressures, norms, and fears of reaction, what is paramount to her is maintain, maintaining those freedoms. Love for herself and, and her varied ways of being are more important than the uncomfortability of others. 
So for the sake of time, we have 15 minutes. I'm gonna switch to um, the two artists that I fo focus in in the Brazilian context. So in 2016, Black trans performance artist in São from Sao Paulo, Linda Quebrada, released her single called Bicha Preta. Almost immediately after the release, the song rippled throughout Brazil to become an anthem for Black LGBTQ people. Bicha Preta, a term originally meant as derogatory for Black femmes in Brazil, has recently been reclaimed by Black LGBTQ communities. Linda Quebrada's use of Bicha Preta was particularly powerful for a Black film performance collective in Salvador, in Salvador Bahia, called Afrobafo. The Afrobafo Collective is an art artivist collective based in the state of Bahia that works to challenge the concepts of gender and sexuality and the anti-Blackness inherent in them. The collective is made up of Black LGBTQ people from the poor and peripheral parts of the city of Salvador. When I interviewed Alan Costa Bispo, one of the founders of the Afrobafo Collective in Salvador in 2019, he explained to me the importance of terms like bicha preta for self-identification. He insists, and this quote is up on the screen, we know that black men in general, they are stereotyped by white power structures as a virile, ma virile man, a super aggressive masculinity. So this ends up flowing into when we talk about sexuality too. White men expect that black men to be virile tops. I never saw my, my, a connection with these racist stereotypes because my body has always been dissident from heteronormativity. I've always been femme. I've always had to I had a way to deal with a society. I, I always had to deal with society a different way than the racist construction of what is expected of a man. I found myself in the place of the Bicha Preta because society ended up pushing me into these places. They tell me, you're not a man because I'm not, the, uh, I'm not what they expected a man to be, end quote. So Bishpo's insistence on working, his, uh, on determining his own definitions of himself as a Bicha Preta works to tear Works to, works to tear back his, his embodied realities from the anti-Black renderings of Black men in society, which relegate Black femmes and bichas pre, pretas to a nowhere land, a continual state of abjection. Bicha preta por bispo, as it served for Linda Quebrada, takes the intersections of multiple marginal places in society and resurrects power from that marginalized place. The intention of reclaiming the terminology of bicha preta is to take back power from the systems that seek to banish these people to the margins of society and put this power back into the hands of the bichas pretas. This powerful act of language which serves to destroy the power and the oppression of bichas pretas, in that the, the oppression that bichas pretas face, is the kind of artistic political work that Afrobafo engages, engages in consistently. So now I'm going to play a quick clip from the Afro from the Afrobafo clip that was produced from the Linda Quebrado song Bicha Preta. <laughs> Louca preta da favela Quando ela tá passando Todos rindo a cara dela Mas se liga, macho Presta muita atenção Senta e observa A tua destruição Que eu sou uma Já louca preta favelada Que quando eu vou passar E ninguém mais vai dar risada Se eu for esperto Pode logo perceber Que eu já não tô a brincadeira Eu vou botar é pra fuder So in this clip, in this song, Linda Quebrada boldly insists that for the Bicha Preta to be, to be free, masculinity in its current renderings must be destroyed. She wraps the lyrics that are on this side and translated. Um, so I'm a crazy Bicha Preta from the favela, bouncing my ass as I walk by and nobody will laugh anymore. And if you were smart, you would realize that I'm not playing anymore. I'll fuck you up. Linda Quebrada makes it clear that this laughter in the direction of her as she passes serves to mark her and other bichas pretas as jokes and object, objections uh, in society and to uphold gender norms for Black people from the periphery. 
These norms are exactly what she seeks to destroy. Linda Quebrada's rejection, rejection of the systems of power that seek to control and limit her own freedom to exist as she desires, serves as an act of manifesting a futuristic freedom where she defends her right to exist by any means necessary. In her own manifestation of this freedom, Linda Quebrada's lyrical self-defense against the policing of the boundaries of masculinity and femininity within the favela and periphery serve as her own destructions of these systems of power that limit her existence as a Bisha Preta. So in conclusion, in a world that provides little reprieve for the oppressed, music, performance, film, and other artistic forms provide ample space to reflect, uh, to reflect the dreams of a better world. Monet's subtle insistence upon defining her, her ways of being in a world and in her art provides a template for manifesting Black queer freedom and imploding gender expectations. Linda Quebrada and Afrobafo finding their, uh, finding their freedom within the identity of Bicha Preta and leaning into a form of being that, that society rejects and uses abject allows Black LGBTQ people to find power in the parts of themselves that society refuses to accept. While Black LGBTQ people live out the, the visions of utopia in their mind, these artistic renderings of freedom allows them space to travel in time to a world where freedom is not a dream, but a tangible reality. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Watufani. Lots of interesting ideas. I got, already got some ideas for intersections there with Regina as well. Um, we'll see what we get with our next speaker, who is Emilia Brito, who's a PhD student in economics. So we're gonna ch change channels a little bit. She specializes in public economics and labor economics. Her research uses applied microeconomic methods to study gender inequalities in education, labor markets, and health. Her current projects include gender differences in educational expectations, role model effects in male dominated fields in academia, and sexual harassment in universities and in work environments. She holds a master's and bachelor's degree from economics from the Universidad de Chile. The title of her talk today is Impacts of COVID-19 on Domestic Violence, Evidence from Rolling Quarantines in Chile. Emilia? Okay, please let me know if you can see my screen. Perfect. Okay, so yes, I'm definitely going to be presenting something quite different from the very interesting projects that uh, my two colleagues just um, just presented. So um, this project in particular is something I've been working on together with some colleagues from Chile. So we're a big team of five uh, researchers and we've been exploring a question that's been going around, I think since the start of the pandemic or at least a couple of months after that, which is what is the effect of uh, quarantine imposition or social distancing measures on domestic violence. So I think Almost um, maybe since a year ago or a bit less, uh, we've seen different news coming from different countries in places that have been under lockdown, suggesting that there's been like a surge in the utilization of different domestic violence resources, particularly different helplines or websites addressed uh, providing information or helping victims. And I think the general worry about the impact of quarantine imposition on domestic violence is related with previous research that suggests that the characteristics of the crisis that we've been experiencing in the last year has a lot of factors that have been previously associated with increases in domestic violence. So we know that domestic violence has been shown to increase uh, during similar crises like natural disasters or previous pandemics. Uh, we also know that it usually spikes when people spend more time together, like during weekends or holidays. 
And it has also been associated with economic stress or unemployment, which has been like one of the key factors of what's been going on during the COVID-19 crisis. So what we want to do in this project is um, basically try to understand the impact of domestic violence, sorry, sorry, the impact of quarantine imposition on different measures of domestic violence. And we think, I mean, this is, of course, I think anything related to domestic violence is already a very important topic, but on top of that, I mean, we already know that different measures of social distancing are likely to continue at least uh, throughout some time. We also know that the effects on domestic violence that we might be experiencing during the pandemic might be persistent even when lockdowns are lifted. And this also might be um, a good opportunity to understand a bit more about what are the underlying factors behind domestic violence and also some of the common obstacles addressing uh, this problem. So the questions that are going to be addressing today well, is basically this general one, what is the impact of quarantines on different measures of domestic violence? And then I'm also going to try to discuss a bit about what are the potential mechanisms that drive this relationship between quarantine imposition and different measures of DV. So we focus on the case of Chile. Um, I'm gonna tell you a bit more about why we do that. I think Chile offers like a very good, um, case of study for this topic because of the way the country has dealt with the pandemic in terms of like um, imposing very fine geographically um, lockdowns. And we also have uh, access to very rich administrative data on different measures of domestic violence. So we can see basically the effect of being under lockdown on calls to helplines, but also in the use of women's shelters and different crime reports. So the way we address this is by using fine geographical and time variation in quarantine imposition. This is what allows us, um, allows our identification. And something nice, I mean, just in terms of like research opportunities is that given already the state of the pandemic in Chile, uh, we are able to analyze both the effect of going into quarantine, but also see if these effects reverse one's uh, places exit quarantine. And something we are currently working on is trying to understand the role of mobility and unemployment in driving these effects. So what we expect to find is, um, well, primarily we believe that quarantine imposition is associated with an increase in the incidence of domestic violence. So we should be able to see that on the number of calls in our data. Uh, at the same time, we also know that there are there have been greater obstacles to reporting during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we also expect we don't really expect the results in calls to line up with the effects in crime reporting. And we also expect to find some persistence in, in these effects, uh, meaning that they are not fully reversed when municipalities exit quarantines. And finally, um, Assuming that economic stress is one of the factors explaining the, the relationship between quarantines and domestic violence, we hope to find uh, stronger impacts in municipalities that have faced worst economic conditions. And well, so this is just a preview of our main findings. Um, what we see, what we have seen, I think in Chile, and this I think pretty much lines up with. Um, research from other countries is that nationwide calls to domestic violence hotlines have increased by 250%, uh, but this increase has been particularly uh, particularly higher in areas that have been under quarantine. And at the same time, we see something like a reverse pattern, pattern when it comes to crime reporting. In this case, um, overall for the country, uh, Police reporting of domestic violence has decreased relative to the pre-pandemic period, and this decrease has been particularly uh, particularly high in areas that have been under quarantine. So, uh, just to explain basically how we analyze this topic in the Chilean context, Chile has uh, over 300 municipalities in the country and some cities actually contain multiple municipalities. For example, that is the case of Santiago and some of the bigger cities. 
and quarantine entry and exit have been staggered over time. So entry into quarantine began, I think, like in many places in mid-March. Um, exits started in July, but there's been like a lot of variation in terms of the timing where different municipalities have entered and exited uh, quarantine. And at the same time, also in the length of these quarantines. And something that is important for us, just in terms of identification, is that there hasn't been really a um, set rule that determines uh, quarantine entry or exit. So this is basically at the discretion of the federal government and Ministry of Health. It is definitely influenced by weekly COVID cases um, and some strategic, strategic considerations, but people can really anticipate or exactly know in advance when the place that you live is going to go under quarantine or not. So this is just to show you how much variation there has been in quarantine position. So this is just the metropolitan region, region of Chile that has around a third or more of the population and where the capital city of Santiago lies. And we see that, sorry, starting in March, there has been a lot of variation even within city. So we basically had like this case where we have just like parts of the city during some weeks or months under quarantine and some others that have been uh, not under normal circumstances, but much closer to normal circumstances. Quarantines in Chile have also been particularly rigid, meaning that when you reside in an area that is under quarantine, you own, for example, usually you only have um, two permits to go outside per week and so you're forced to basically get a permit by the police. You do that online, but if you're caught being outside without that, uh, I mean, you can just um, be sent back home or in the worst case, you can just um, have to pay a fine or eventually be detained. And well, since March, um, by now, most of the country I think at some point have been uh, I mean, not most, but a big share of the country have at some point experienced uh, being under lockdown. But there's also many places that have been under lockdown and are currently out of lockdown. So we're able to check what is the um, total effect of quarantine entry and exit. So the main da data that we have is basically, well, first we have these three different measures of domestic violence that I think I already mentioned. And on top of that, we have some economic measures, basically some measures of employment or economic uncertainty and some measures of COVID intensity. So very quickly, what we do is that we estimate um, event study models at the municipality level. So what we wanna do here is just to be able to compare places that go into lockdown with those places that remain out of lockdown and see how domestic, the different domestic violence measures that we have evolve over time comparing these two groups. So what we should expect if this methodology is applied correctly is that these two places, these two groups of municipalities should look relatively similar before quarantine imposition. And then any differences that we see after that should correspond or at least we can interpret them as um, a causal impact of quarantine imposition. So we do exactly the same also for quarantine exit. And then we estimate a general model just to have like an average effect of uh, quarantine entry and exit for all full sample. So this is our first set of results. So what we have here is the effect of quarantine imposition on the number of calls to the police because of domestic violence cases. So this is a number that is particularly addressed that providing help for domestic violence cases. So similar to what I was just saying, we see that um, in the period in previous to the pandemic, these two groups of municipalities behave relatively similar in terms of the level of the calls to these hotlines, but after quarantine imposition, there's an important spike in the number of calls 
made to this uh, DB hotline that actually persist over time. Um, I'm going to skip this because this is this is almost exactly the same, just with a slightly different sample. But in both cases, um, we see an important increase in the number of calls when places go into lockdown. Um, we see exactly the same pattern when we just focus on one type of domestic violence, on physical violence. One of the issues in analyzing this data is that we, you know, people might say maybe just going into quarantine makes people more worry about, you know, like domestic violence. It is something that has been under discussion during the COVID crisis. So maybe, you know, this increase is more related to just people asking for information. So just trying to address that, uh, in this case in particular, we, we focus on calls that are basically calls for help for cases of physical violence, and we see exactly the same pattern. When it comes to crime report, uh, we see the reverse pattern, right? We see that after quarantine imposition, there seems to be a decrease in the number of domestic violence cases that are reported to the police or the judicial system. And, and okay, and, and on top of that, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we are able to do is basically compare the effects of going into quarantine with the effects of exiting uh, a lockdown. And what we find is that at least in the number of calls, I mean, both of these things um, move in the direction that one would expect. We see calls going up in places that are under lockdown. We see calls going down when these same places exit lockdown. But what is important here and can be like a very uh, important in terms of like uh, policy to address domestic violence is that the, the size of the effect of, go of exiting quarantine is actually smaller than the size of the effect of going into quarantine. So this means that there could be some persistence in this um, initial increase in domestic violence produced by being under lockdown. And, and then again, um, the results show something very similar in the case of crime reporting. We also see a reverse pattern for municipalities exiting lockdown. I'm skipping these tables because it's just like a summary of what I'm showing you in the graphs. And then our last measure of, of domestic violence, uh, which is the use of women's shelter. So in this case, we use a relatively different strategy because in this case, data is just at the regional level, not at the municipality level. But in any case, we perform a similar event study methodology. And what we find is that, again, the same thing as calls and crime reporting, we see an increase in the number of population in domestic violence shelters right after quarantine entry. And then there also seems to be a decrease that takes a bit longer to actually manifest, but still when places exit um, lockdowns. Finally, um, what we do is that we split our sample, um, basically trying to identify which municipalities has, have faced uh, harsh economic conditions. So we do this just by using one measure, which is the share of workers in vulnerable sectors. So these vulnerable sectors are defined by those economic sectors that were most heavy hit by the pandemic. So in this case, we are focusing on workers uh, previously working in hospital hospitality, construction, and artistic activities. And we do see that the impact of lockdowns on this measure of domestic violence seems to be higher in places that also faced harsher economic conditions. So um, we're trying to analyze these or understand these as uh, evidence suggesting that economic stress might be a relevant factor in explaining this relationship. 
en sorry okay so i'm just about to finish so just uh trying to summarize our results so what we can conclude, at least from the Chilean experience, and then again, this is very much in line with what we have seen in other places, is that quarantine imposition has led to an increase in different indicators of domestic violence, or at least domestic violence related distress. But at the same time, it has led to lower police reports. So I, we know that this is an issue. Uh, we also find that lifting quarantine leads to a, a reversal in the impacts of imposing quarantines, but this reversal seems to be incomplete, at least when we analyze distress calls. So this might either suggest that quarantines have a real impact in causing persistent DV, or that their imposition accentuates, for example, underlying uncertainty. Um, we also know that quarantine is associated with a short drop in mobility. So that those are results that I didn't show you today because I didn't want to when I overwhelm you with um, too much information. And we also see that is it increased uh, unemployment rates. And the last set of results that I show you uh, basically show that the effects of quarantine seems to be stronger in municipalities that face worse economic conditions. So this is what we have uh, right now for this project. Uh, future work, something that we're actually currently working on is trying to complement this with an in-person survey direct, directly asking women about their experience to see if the effects that we can get out of administrative data actually line up with what people directly tell about their experiences related to domestic violence or family conflict uh, during the pandemic. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Amelia. Uh, you have a question. P other uh, people who are participating could send questions to the Q&A. There's a question for you in the chat and it's from Patsy. And she says, uh, thanks to everybody for three great presentations, which I would second. Um, my question is for Amelia. Is there any information on the intensity of violence being reported during lockdown and whether this might have any relationship to the increased incidents of calls. To put this differently, are people more likely to face or fear more intense forms of violence under lockdown that might make them more likely to report domestic violence? Um, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. <laughs> I can, thank you. Um, so, I mean, this is, a, this is something that we're currently trying to answer. I think one of the um, one of the analyses that I showed um, focused specifically on physical violence. So in that case, we cannot really tell within the category of physical violence how severe those cases are. I mean, if these are, let's say, cases of someone who is reporting, I don't know, my partner hit me, slapped me, or, you know, like threatened my life or anything like that. But at least what we are able to see with the um, police data is that I think all types of violence have gone up. So we see this in particularly in psychological violence and physical violence. At the same time, we also we've also analyzed um, the evolution of another helpline that is more related to providing, let's say, information, uh, not so much just just um, responding to, to actual cases. And in that case, there's also been a huge increase related to lockdown. So I think in this case, there is a bit of two things going on. One is related to incidents. So I think women are experiencing um, more cases of domestic violence throughout the pandemic, but at the same time, um, there's also more distress general that also explains some of the results. Um, I don't know if that uh, answers your question, but I think that is what we've currently learned from the data. And I see here also a second question. So what we find is that 
So calls and, calls and reporting a crime are two different things. So in at least in the Chilean context, you can, I mean, you or either like a neighbor or anyone else, like a third party can call the police about a domestic violence case. But then if you actually want to do something about that, if you want to um, start like a crime report that will lead to a process in the justice system, that's a different story. I mean, sometimes, especially for the most severe cases, the police should theoretically offer women that option when they actually reach their home, but that's not usually the case. So it takes, um, it usually depends on the victim if they want to do that. And throughout the pandemic, that also meant that for most of the time, you actually had to leave your house and go to a police station to make the actual uh, crime report. So we know that there have been like several obstacles for that, even if incidence is going up, you know, like there's just like fear if you're stuck home with your abuser, is that a good idea or not? Um, there's also just like a fear of, of um, health related concerns, right? Just going outside and, you know, like public space talking to other people. And then there was also the case that, um, when you were under strict lockdown, um, people were usually really careful of how they were going to spend their two opportunities to, to go outside. I mean, that might sound a bit crazy in terms of like how flexible that system should be with these cases, but there were like a couple of news where actually police detained women that were outside, um, alleging that they were victims of DV and they were trying to get some help, but they were, I don't know, outside, you know, without a permit or under in, at night during curfew. So I think there were like a lot of us obstacles to crime reporting. So it makes sense for us to see um, a decrease in crime reporting. But at the same time, when we talk about calls, it's just the number of people calling to this particular line. And what this line does is just it provides help. And for severe cases, you get a um, police car at your place, but that doesn't mean that the process is gonna go any further than that. So thanks for that that answer. I think that was very thorough. Um, and Patsy, thanks you for that important distinction and clarification. So the next question we have is from uh, Keisha Khan Perry, who says, good afternoon, Watu, congratulations on this fascinating work. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this chapter fits into the overall focus and argument of the dissertation project? and how your work challenges our understanding of Latin American studies as a field? And those are some big questions. <laughs> yes, very big. <laughs> Nothing less than I would expect my advice. <laughs> um, thank you for the question, Kishikan. Khan. So my overall dissertation project looks at um, Black LGBTQ activism in the United States and Brazil. Um, specifically asking the question of what is the transformative potential of Black LGBTQ activism um, in a world that fragments um, their identities and oppresses their um, forms of being. Um, and so throughout the chapter, I focused on different, uh, different forms of activism, different spaces in which Black, Black queer and trans activists are um, organizing. So in my first chapter, um, I take a look at uh, these black queer black lgbtq uh centered spaces um that black lgbtq activists are creating in both countries um and specifically ask the question of what does it mean to create a black lgbtq centered spaces and how are these spaces different than what it is that they pass through in any other space so how are these spaces creating a certain kind of freedom of self um that other spaces because of the ways in which heteropatriarchy capitalism and white supremacy permeates are not able to create. And then how do these spaces, while they try and create this kind of freedom, still, um, uh, still, um, still living within those systems of power that create these unfreedoms for Black LGBTQ people. Um, so that's my first chapter. In my second chapter, I take a look at uh, the, uh, the 
participation of Black LGBTQ people within larger movements for social justice. So I take a look at Black LGBTQ leadership within the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, uh, within uh, the LGBTQ advocacy, certain LGBTQ advocacy movements in Rio de Janeiro, um, and then uh, a, a specific uh, Black gay movement that started um, in the early 1980s in Salvador Bahia in Brazil. So I take a look at how are Black uh, LGBTQ people transforming Black movement, transforming LGBTQ movements um, through these kinds of intersectional analysis that, that they're bringing to these movements, and how are those conversations then expanding um, the conversations about objectives in these movements, the visions of what's the project of Black freedom. What's the project of LGBTQ advocacy when you think about it from the space of a Black LGBTQ person's perspective? Um, and then in my third chapter, I look at the core representation identity politics. Uh, and I get this through the, the political sphere. Um, so I look at a group of Black LGBTQ politicians who have entered, uh, who have been elected in the United States and Brazil, and look at how they utilize um, ideas around identity politics, whether to further Black LGBTQ freedom um, or to weaponize the conversations around identity to work against freedom for their own communities. Um, and so I look at the varied ways in which the, the, the Black LGBTQ representational politics, identity politics are playing out um, within the political sphere. And then finally, this last chapter that I presented to you all today, um, I look at this question of Black, Black LGBTQ freedom. How are Black LGBTQ activists um, constructing Black LGBTQ freedom, and then how are artists reflecting those kind, those same things that activists are talking about. So in this chapter, in this chapter that I presented on today, I'm really using my interlocutors as the theoretical foundations for thinking through the questions of Black LGBTQ freedom um, that are reflected in the artistic works of Black LGBTQ artists. Um, and so that's the that's the overall structure of my dissertation. And with this dissertation, the reason that I'm focusing on Brazil and the United States, it's really to work against um, the historic constructions, the kind of compare to contrast uh, constructions of the United States and Brazil that have historically um, been put in place by scholars, both of Brazil and Latin Americanists, um, that have have kind of said that you know race functions in this kind of separatist way in the United States. Therefore, that makes racism function in a, in, a, in a very different way than it functions in Brazil. And what we've seen within uh, Black activist communities in both the United States and Brazil is pushing back against that narrative. That that narrative actually doesn't take into account, one, the varied ways in which racism, anti-Blackness functions within one country, within different regions, but it also doesn't take into account the similarities that are, um, that are, that are happening between it, uh, with systems of anti-Blackness and white supremacy in the United States and in Latin America. And so my project is really working against those, the, the, the fractures of um, conversations in the Black diaspora that are put up by um, scholars, Latin American scholars and Brazilian scholars um, that really that that try to try to, to to form barriers to understanding what are the connections um, between the Black queer diaspora. And so that's that's really at the heart of my work. I'm looking at these two places. Um, I'm looking at these two places together specifically to understand what are the ways in which Black LGBTQ communities are connected across borders. Hey, thank you. Um, I'll just give you a really short follow up to that, to your what you just said. One of the things I noticed and not being so familiar with your work as your advisor is, um, but I thought Janelle Monet's, um, she was much more, I mean, she's, it's a totally different style of presentation and she's much more really socially acceptable. I mean, she's challenging, but you know, even like you, as you pointed out the queer queen, she doesn't quite do it. And I noticed it, the, the, that last image you showed where she's up there with the other dancers. I mean, she looks like the masculine figure and they're wearing the short skirts and showing their legs. I mean, in that way, it looks like just inverting things, not, not nearly as challenging as the Brazilians that you showed us. That's just a reaction. I mean, it's really interesting. I think one of the reasons why I chose Janelle Monet and then these two um, black femme artists, these black, uh, Black trans, in, it, one Black trans artist and one Black femme artist, um, specifically because of because I think that there's a way in which 
what Janelle Monet was doing early in her career was read as, oh, well, she's just hiding um, her sexuality. Um, and I think that I think it's important for us to revisit what she's specifically doing, because I actually think what she's doing is is asserting a self a self definition, asserting a, a self determination in saying that I'm going to, to be in charge of what my gender presentation is, what my uh, sexuality is and how I'm going to define that. And I'm going and, and I'm not going to let uh, these these pressures from the music industry, pressures from society to define my sexuality in one way. Um, I'm not going to let those control what I'm going to do artistically. And so I think that just as, I think that it's easier to see the, the kind of politicality in what Linda Quebrado, Afrobach was doing specifically because of the ways in which um, Black trans figures, black femmes, and society, black femmes um, who are assigned male at birth uh, are seen as abject in societies openly. Um, and I, but I think that there's a way in which the 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 kind of the 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 ways in which people interpret a kind of quiet politicality around what Janelle Monae was doing or not or interpret that not as political kind of goes to goes to the ways in which it's 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 ignoring um, the pressures of black women um, within the music industry and outside of the, the music industry so like for instance in another song that I analyzed from this album uh, get a woman I talk about the ways in which Janelle Monae takes this figure of the get a woman um, in, in in the context of you know thinking through the Daniel uh, the Moynihan report which really faulted um, working class black women um, as the problem with the black family because they were seen as too too masculine too too dominating um, and so Janelle Monet takes this figure of the ghetto woman and puts it first talk, talks about how her mom is this kind of embodiment of the ghetto woman, and then takes that and queers the idea of it and, and finds the power in it. That's where she's she's locating her, her, her the kind of queer gender presentation that she's presenting. Um, she locates it within the ghetto woman. And so that's a kind that, so I think what she's doing with the idea of, around um, black women's gender presentation is really shaking things up. And I think a lot of folks missed what was going on there because they were thinking that, oh, well, you know, she's just waiting to come out. And she did come out, but I don't think that that changes um, the kinds of the power in the, in the ways in which she was reimagining gender and sexuality um, in that time. Okay, thanks. Question for Regina here we have from Jordan. She, he says, thanks for a great presentation on how poetry intervenes in, a very, in very important questions. In considering the art produced on issues of environment, the Anthropocene and motherhood, what is your sense for how poetry compares to and differs from other art forms, music, film, novels, et cetera, and engaging with these issues and reaching different readers or viewers? Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I hope I can answer this uh, in a satisfying way, uh, way. This is a conversation I've had with my advisor <laughs> for a couple of years now. <laughs> um, I think so. The the reason that that poetry is appealing to me, and I do work uh, with other uh, forms uh, like narrative, um, is that it is it is it has condensed or compressed, uh, in you know in in the words or in the spaces of the page, uh, you know meanings in in a way that you know a, a novel needs a whole scene. Um, and for me, uh, for me, that's very the powerful. The powerful of, of uh, the, the power of a, a verse. Or, for example, um, in my presentation, I uh, I have a whole bit on uh, what a parenthetical does, and I think uh, that is very hard to do. Uh, or not not that it's very hard to do, but in a in a novel, it's it's just a, a four hundred or three hundred page novel. A parenthesis, maybe it's not that relevant, but if you have a stanza with just a single verse with parenthesis, you're making a statement. It has just, it has more power, I think. And I was thinking now as I was reading your question also about why environmental things, and I was thinking about the urgency of environmental issues during the Anthropocene and how um, poetry sort of like a reduced um, 
form of writing in the sense of, of um, in the recycling process and how it is more environmental. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I just think that 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 each each word, each space, each sign is imbued in in, in with meaning in ways that that other forms uh, like uh, film or like novels you mentioned um, don't have that that just stroke like that power. However, I'm I'm not an expert uh, in music, but I I feel like I don't know if someone who does music would, would disagree with me, but I feel like poetry is more like music um, in, in, in that sense um, to, yeah, to appeal to, to the senses in some other way. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a wonderful question, Jordan, thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you want to talk then a little bit, just to sort of to elaborate, Regina, this seems sort of in line about th this relative to your larger project, because um, if you you don't have to, you can do it chapter by chapter, or you could just sort of give us an overview of, of how it is your... Yeah, um, well, this, um, the, this, this uh, collection of poems uh, will be a, a part of my, the third chapter of my dissertation. Uh, so uh, my dissertation will be about what I'm calling textures of the subterranean. So it is all about uh, literature uh, written by women uh, of Mexico and uh, Latinx women, uh, what we call uh, now Greater Mexico. Um, so, uh, and all texts about the subterranean. So I have four chapters, uh, one about caves, um, uh, which um, it, it is sort of like a, 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 about identity uh, to authors, Gloria Saldua and Rosario Castellanos, who go back to caves as a way of going back to a search for identity um, and rebirths and new beginnings and the cave as a sort of like a womb-like space. Um, and then the second chapter is about um, fosas, uh, clandestinas and burial sites. Um, and uh, that there I will talk about Sara Uribe's uh, Antigona Gonzalez and uh, a Latinx author that I really like called Fajardo, Cali Fajardo Anstein. And she, she, she's more focused on like the, um, the fact that underneath our feet in the United States, there, there are burial grounds uh, for, for Native Americans and so, sort of a reclaiming of the earth. Uh, well, the, the land that we stand on as, as, as her, theirs. Um, and then this is the third chapter. My third chapter is about uh, trees, roots, and water. Uh, this poem is really about water, creek water as like stemming from the underground, but it's really more about trees and, and roots. Uh, there's a lot in this uh, uh, collection of poems about roots. And the, um, the other book that goes with this is a, collection, a beautiful collection of poems by Maricela Guerrero called um, El Sueño de Toda Célula, the, the dream of every cell. I don't know if it's yet translated to English. I'm trying to find out. Um, and they're both very similar. They use, they're, they're both very focused on, they do like a zoom into nature. Uh, they're both very feminist. The topic of motherhood crosses a little bit. Um, and uh, they, they both use uh, some sort of scientific language to, to refer to nature and they're very concerned with pollution and um, extractivism. Um, and the last chapter is about earthquakes. Um, so that, that'll be like my ending, sort of like a, an earth shattering by, by women, uh, creating an, a sort of like a new genealogy of, of women writers and in, in I'm staying in Latin America, but really I'm just working in, in greater Mexico. Great, Thank, thanks a lot. I have another question for Amelia. Um, I don't know if you've thought of doing a, or if you're, you had, I don't know what kind of data is available to do a comparative project. I was thinking of comparing, uh, I've heard Uruguay had a very different response to COVID for multiple reasons about their healthcare system and other and I didn't know whether you would have data or be able to do some kind of, if, you're, if you had that in a future plan or what you were thinking of, um, it would be interesting, so. 
Yeah, no, that sounds like a great uh, question. I think so far we've only focused on on the case of Chile primarily because we were using this kind of like within country or like even within city uh, variation to just um, to 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 study these questions, but. I think over the last few months, we've seen like many papers uh, basically addressing uh, similar questions in different countries. And I think uh, in the case of Latin America, it would be really, yeah. In the case of Latin America, I've seen relatively similar results, for example, for Peru or Argentina, which I think faced, um, I mean, every country had their like, you know, like particular way of dealing with the pandemic. But in both cases, I think these were countries that were placing like um, heavy restrictions on mobility and that were not doing so well at some point. So I agree with you that it would be really interesting to see if um, different experiences, I think like Uruguay in Latin America um, experienced something similar or not. So no, I'll definitely look into if there's similar data there so we can check um, how similar the results are. Thank you. Yeah, let's see, I'm gonna check, see if we have any other questions. No other questions? Do you panelists have questions for each other? I, I have another question, I can go ahead. I, I, Watufani, I have a question. Um, you, your title is Black Queer Freedom, which I think is a book by uh, Gershon Aviles but you didn't mention that in the course of things. And I don't really know how, I haven't read the book yet. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about how that subtends your talk, because it must be part of your project, a major part. It's a recent book, no? So that is a book that I have not read yet. <laughs> and now that you uh, mentioned- Well, then you can't talk about that. <laughs> um, it's, no, I mean, so thank you for that. I'm gonna- check it out because I'm sure it will be part of uh, the literature for them to, to use for the dissertation. Um, but no, I haven't uh, yet interacted with that work. I've been spending these last, you know, eight months writing. So it's been difficult to pick up uh, the newest books. <laughs> oh no, you can't read everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, it is brand new. I think it's, I think it's last year it book out. So I haven't read it yet either. I just, I thought you would be ahead of me, so. <laughs> Other questions? Regina, I have one more question about, you know, I understand your argument about re, kind of revising this toxic uh, motherhood, but I tell you, toxic motherhood just resonates with me. I mean, first of all, it has a kind of a psychological resonance. I mean, your first thought, I mean, you're saying, yeah, it's literal in this case. It's not, it's not a psychological or a sociological term, um, but it's, it's hard to, I understand your argument about how it could be a way of unsettling, but it's hard to to remove it from how much so much mother blaming that goes on culturally in so many societies for children's differences or ills. Do you? Can you? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, well, in in principle, that was uh, uh, intentional. I uh, discussed this with uh, the professor that I. Uh, um, talked to while I was uh, writing this and um, I, I'm following this this author uh, 10 who who uses so they they are uh, ill with some like um, illness caused by uh, aluminum toxicity or something that happened to them when they were while they were young and so they use this uh, um, term of toxicity on themselves and it is meant to be subversive so that's why I say like the uptake of the of the of the toxic right so I explain how these mothers become toxic I know and and, and so there's there's a lot more uh, that doesn't fit in a 15 minute conversation right but this um, this theory starts with how we use toxic as a as a, as a as a word to say like a toxic work environment, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Or a, a toxic, I don't know, politician or something. So, so when something that, that we feel like attacks us and we, we want to expel it and just take it out of our view. 
Um, but but this this scar, what they are doing is trying to use this term and say, okay, in 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 real terms, when when there is some like lead or mercury poisoning and that it's actually polluting a, a body or a or a, a creek that is making it toxic. So the, in this case, the, the the mother that I was that I'm discussing, and she becomes toxic and is really a you know a N not her blame and in turn she's just holding this huge responsibility of feeding the children with toxic water and I thought well maybe this can become something that you know when you say it, you make people uncomfortable and then it becomes sort of like um like you know what what uh Chen calls the uptake of the toxic so you see how you 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 become you use the negative to make it positive and and use that to unsettle and to show society what is making them uncomfortable and in this case what i think that makes uh, us uncomfortable is partly what we associate with toxic but then if we think about well why is why did this mother become toxic because she was drinking water from a creek that was polluted by like these big companies and uh, why is she the one doing, you know, there's one that the, the water is being polluted by these big companies. And also why are the mothers the one that are toxic more than uh, the fathers because they are the ones doing these naturalized roles. So I'm trying to do these two things at the same time. Um, but it is, I am I'm, I'm sort of happy that you are uh, uncomfortable with it because that is that is sort of <laughs> the, the goal. Um, there i don't know i don't know if i should change it or not because that is sort of the the reaction but i i, I understand uh, that the that it is a horrible thing to hear <laughs> <laughs> well patsy has another question that she's put you in the chat but i think we have to wrap up don't we we only have till 2 30 so i think the next panel is ready to start now no yes i think so but i can i can write uh, patsy back on the chat <laughs> Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Jill. Um, and thank you, Emilia, Watu, and Regina for three fascinating presentations. Um, I, we now enter our second part of the afternoon with our second um, panel, um, which will be chaired by Erica Durante and our, pa our panelists are Jordan Jones and Benjamin Salinas. And I would just introduce um, Erica briefly. Uh, professor Erica Durante is a visiting associate professor of Latin American and Caribbean studies here at Brown. And she's also the director of our undergraduate studies concentration here at CLACS. Erica has held the position of tenured associate professor of comparative literature at the University of Louvain, Belgium. Her research has focused on European and Latin American culture, sorry, literature, on literature and globalization, and on Francophone writers of Africa and the Caribbean. Funded by the Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University, she has compiled the edition of Jorge Luis Borges' personal library in the precious Borges archive in Buenos Aires. She's author of several books and edited collections. Her most recent book is Air Travel, Fiction and Film, Cloud People. And that was published last year by Palgrave Macmillan. And again, congratulations on the publication, Erica. So I will now hand over to Erica and to the background. Great, thanks so much, Patsy, for the nice introduction. And thanks everyone for being here this afternoon. Um, sorry for, um, I apologize if I was not able to attend the previous presentations. I'm trying to catch up uh, with the answers to the questions. So I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you all to the second panel of these uh, Spring 2021 CLAX Graduate Student Symposium. We're very grateful to our affiliated faculty. Some of them are uh, here in the audience and graduate students for being always so involved in our center and in the many events that we organize, um, even in this pandemic, uh, such as this one, which is the third uh, graduate student symposium in the past three years. 
This afternoon, we wish to welcome our two panelists, Jordan Jones from the Portuguese and Brazilian Studies Department here at Brown and Benjamin Salinas from the Anthropology Department. I can see Jordan coming in and Benjamin, hi. Um, I will briefly present them and then allocate to each of them 15 minutes uh, for their presentation. Then we will have time for questions at the end. For these, I invite the audience to use the Q&A function in, uh, in Zoom to progressively post their questions for Jordan and Benjamin. Jordan, um, I will start presenting you now. So Jordan Jones is a fourth year PhD student in Portuguese and Brazilian studies and will complete an MA in Hispanic studies as well in May. His dissertation analyzes literature from across the Americas, focusing on readers' emotional responses to novels that engage with human rights and social justice. Jordan is originally from Texas, but spent five of his adolescent and young adult years living in Brazil. He studied at Brigham Young University, where he earned a BA in English and Portuguese in 2014, and an MA in Luso-Brazilian Literatures in 2015. In 2017, he completed a Master of Education in Secondary English Education at John Hopkins University, and he lives with his wife and three children in East Providence. Thanks so much, Jordan, for participating, participating in this symposium. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation entitled Confronting the Legacy of Slavery in Contemporary Literature of the Americas. Just one second, I will now present Benjamin. Benjamin Salinas is a graduate student in the Anthropology Department at Brown. His interests lie in the intersection of music, language, and identity. His current research is focused on how indigenous language hip hop artists in Mexico mobilize their identity through rap music to resist language loss. He is specifically interested in how performance of language and culture make artists legible to different groups from which they can draw various types of support. Thanks so much, Jordan, for joining us today. And we are delighted to hear very soon your presentation entitled Rap Originario, Indigenous Language Hip Hop and Multicultural State in Mexico. So Jordan, the floor is now yours. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to, before I begin, thank the, the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, uh, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Kuhnheim, Dr. Durante, Kate Goldman, fellow presenters and everyone else involved in organizing and, uh, and putting together this event and especially those of you who are attending as well. Um, so I'm just going to dive in to my presentation today, um, which will look at anti-slavery novels of the Americas in the 19th century. And uh, I hope you can um, see my screen. Um, and I'll just go ahead and dive in. So the motivation for this project um, grew out of several personal experiences. Uh, the first of which was living in Sao Paulo as a young boy. I was largely unaware of and unconcerned with those residing just across the street in the Paraisópolis favela community. The second experience began six years later when I served as a missionary in Paraíba in the Northeast of Brazil and inter interacted more closely with individuals on the economic and social margins. And the third experience began in 2015 when I moved to Baltimore to teach literature to a predominantly African-American high school student population. And I was pushed to think critically about what studying literature could actually do to help my students and others address the challenges they faced, including economic instability, violence, and racial inequality. And though I don't view literature as the solution to all of the world's problems, uh, these different experiences and my time at Brown have powerfully shaped my belief that literature can create spaces of empathy and revelation and promote ethical thinking and action. And that premise continues to, uh, to guide my research and orient my dissertation project, which devotes particular attention to moral instruction and calls to action, whether implicit or explicit, related to slavery, racial inequality, and the physical and social displacement of marginalized individuals or groups. In analyzing the texts that are in my dissertation, I rely on reader response theory and affect theory, both of which focus on the reader's experience with a specific text and the ways in which the reader's own attitudes and life experience condition their cognitive and emotional reactions to the text. In other words, what do the readers bring to the text and how does that inform how they engage with it? 
And in my analysis, I focus on the following questions. By appealing to readers' emotions, to what extent can literature promote empathy for others or change attitudes about pressing social and ethical issues? How has it done this in the past and how does it operate now? How does the role that literature plays in establishing a moral discourse compare between the various regions and major languages of the Americas? And my overall argument is that engaged literature issues an ethical call, which summons readers to cross the borders, separating them from those they read about, to empathize with them and to feel discomfort at their victimization. As they do this, their attitudes and beliefs can be reshaped, which can lead them to be receptive to, to the systemic changes needed to create a more tolerant and just society that reflects the values they claim to treasure. In the case of the 19th century, abolitionist texts appeal to readers' sense of morality by affirming the humanity and feelings of enslaved subjects and by inviting readers to mentally place themselves in their shoes in order to foster empathy and change the way they view and act with regard to slavery. And as I said earlier today, I'll be discussing the first portion of my dissertation, which focuses on anti-slavery novels written in the 19th century. Ursula, which, is, uh, which was published in 1859 by an Afro-Brazilian author named Maria Firmino dos, dos Reis. Francisco, which was written in 1840 and published in 1880 by Cuban author Anselmo Suarez y Romero and Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852 by U.S. author Harriet Beecher Stowe. And these, novels, these novels are all written in a similar moment in terms of their relative history and the, uh, of their national history. Importing slaves into each country has been outlawed at this point, but the slave trade within the national borders is still legal. And in analyzing these texts uh, in my dissertation, I focus on various themes that push readers to feel for enslaved characters. So I look at racist views, descriptions of racist views of the slaves, physical violence inflicted against them, and how their deaths are explicitly and implicitly equated to those of Christian martyrs. And I don't have time to go into all that today, so I thought I'd just focus on one specific aspect, which is common to the three novels, and that is descriptions of the subjectivity and family life of the enslaved characters. And I'll just note that I'm going to present a series of quotes here. I've translated them into English just to help the audience read through them, uh, but in, in my work, of course, I use the, the original languages. So in the very beginning of Ursula, uh, a young enslaved man named Tulio comes across another man who's wounded. His name is Tancredo and he decides to save him. Um, and this, this injured man is white, uh, Tulio of course is black, and, and while a violent slave may have left him for dead or even actively harmed him further, we read that slavery had not degraded Tulio's soul. And though he's unhappy, he is virtuous and he acts accordingly. He acts the part of the Good Samaritan. Tancredo, the man who he sa saves, will later fall in love with Ursula and both of them are white characters. They're the protagonists of the novel. But it's important to note that their relationship uh, is only possible because of the selfless actions of an enslaved character. Tancredo will later thank Tulio by giving him the money needed to purchase his own freedom. But after doing so, Tulio decides to stick around and continue to serve Tancredo, underscoring the idea that a freed slave is not a threat to the exo existing social order. So we have the independence and subjectivity of this Afro-Brazilian character, but he's also loyal and true to white characters and continues to occupy a place of submission. But despite this subaltern, subaltern position, the narrator explains that Tancredo's estimation for Tulio might come close to the regard Tulio has for him. In other words, Tulio is clearly equal, if not superior, to Tancredo in terms of his emotional reservoir. Once again, we see the reaffirmation of Tulio's humanity, which undercuts arguments that Africans were subhuman and could therefore be enslaved, no problem. In the case of Susanna, who's an elderly enslaved woman who serves Ursula, the main female character in the novel, and her mother, we see a similar nobility uh, in terms of her caring for Ursula and her bedridden mother and being loyal to the end. And, and in the end, she'll give her life to protect Ursula. But what adds to her subjectivity is that we get access to her backstory. She's captured in Africa and torn from her family. And she tells Tulio of, uh, of her for former freedom, of her dear husband, of a daughter who she loved so much and explains that she became a slave because of the barbarousness of her captors. And while her tears were not enough to soften her captors' hearts at the time, they are meant to touch the novel's readers and invoke their compassion. Later on in this passage, we see the impossibility of understanding the pain she went through, as well as a stinging rebuke of the slave society. Susanna says, it's horrible to remember that human beings treat their fellows in such a way and that their consciences aren't pricked by their evil deeds. Readers encountering Susanna's description of her former life and her violent separation from her family are called to recognize that this is wrong. Their connection to Susanna is facilitated by what Lynn Hunt calls imagined empathy, 
which requires a leap of faith of imagining that someone else is like you. And by showing that Suzanne is not just some slave whose existence has always been under the conditions of captivity, by showing that she's a wife and a mother whose family were destroyed by, or was, uh, were destroyed by, by slavery, readers are pushed to concede that she's not so different from them after all. And in this passage, she also explains that though she loves Ursula and her mother deeply, only death can erase the pain she feels for what she's lost. And I'll just point out the number of exclamation points, which suggest the depth of emotions that this wife and mother is capable of feeling and a reminder to readers that she is family-centered and that she resembles them more than they have, may have previously thought. In the Cuban novel, Francisco, which tells the story of Francisco and Dorotea, two enslaved characters who love each other, but are separated by their cruel master, readers are likewise granted access, albeit with fewer details, to an enslaved character's former life in Africa. The knowledge that Francisco was ripped from Africa at age 10 reaffirms his depth and subjectivity as does the revelation that he knows how to read and write, unusual knowledge for any slave and especially for one whose native language was not Spanish. And as in Ursula, this and other narrative strategies push readers to reconsider common views of slaves. These include emotional language and narrative cues, as well as punctuation, uh, which I mentioned earlier in terms of the, the exclamation points. And all of that uh, readers encounter in this passage, which you'll see uh, in in this moment in the novel, Francisco has been moved from the big house to the sugar mill, which is uh, where conditions are worse and, and the labor is harder. And he sits and reflects painfully on his situation. He's chained and he's subjected to countless blows and lashes. And, and you'll see here that the narrator explicitly tells us in that last line to feel sorry for him. The final exclamation point, along with a pitiful description of Francisco, call attention to the impossibility of understanding his suffering and is also an explicit call for readers to grieve alongside Francisco. In another passage, the narrator explains that upon hearing the songs uttered by the enslaved, it would be necessary to not be human, to hear those cries and not be moved to tears. This statement underscores the message that any readers considering themselves to be civilized should feel as the narrator does, horrified at the suffering of all slaves and of Francisco in particular. In addition to describing Francisco's feelings and pitiable plight, Suarez y Romero, the author, develops his subjectivity by giving him a family. In the novel, Francisco and Dorotea represent a family unit that is torn apart by the horrors of slavery, just as Susana's family is torn apart in Ursula. This was sure to strike a chord with imagined readers since in the 19th century, the family was uh, strongly championed as the crucial unit of society. In Francisco, the young slave and the narrator both affirm his faithful service to his master and the shock that it was for him to have fallen out of favor. Both his faithful service and him, his emotional depth in discussing his past actions underscore his dignity and invite readers to sympathize with him. And while most readers would not have been able to identify with his experience in slavery, they were likely able to relate to what he describes next, his love for Dorotea, his anxiety over when and where, whether to declare his love and his despair when their relationship was tested. He, wonder, he later wonders why he was born and what loving Dorotea has brought him other than, other than tears. Midway through the novel, we learn that Dorotea, who is pregnant in its opening scenes, has had the child. And Francisco learns that his baby uh, is very weak and may die soon. He grieves for his own pain and for his daughter's plight in which she drinks her mother's tears rather than her milk. And he looks forward to their reunion in heaven. And this, Passionate declaration by Francisco reveals the depth of his love for Dorotea and his desire to build a family, a crucial component, as I said earlier, of society for many 19th century readers. The exclamation point underscore his agony at being separated from his family, laying bare the evils of the system that tears families apart and induces so many anguished tears. While some readers may rationalize that Francisco is somehow deserving of his treatment, Few who claim to love God and family would remain unmoved at the image of this helpless child who yearns for milk and finds only tears. This bodily overflow of emotion and despair represent further cues to readers, pushing them to recoil at the suffering of an innocent child and at the institution that causes it. Whereas in Francisco, we have access to the father of a broken family. In Ursula, we learn of the impact such separations have on a child and on a mother. Susanna's description of her former life reproduced earlier in my presentation provides access to a mother's perspective and to the great pain caused by being torn from her family in Africa and stripped of her freedom. In this passage, Susanna also explains that although she loves Ursula and her mother deeply, as I said earlier, only death can erase the pain that she feels. 
And once again, this passage is loaded with exclamation points, attesting to the depth of emotions that this wife and mother is capable of feeling. Um, and in addition to, to encountering the perspective of, of the mother, uh, or a mother cut off from her child, Ursula sheds light through the perspective of Tulio on the impact these separations have on children. When Tulio's mother is purchased by uh, a slaveholder, she's sent away and he never sees her again. And this crushing emotional blow constitutes a badly scarred or poorly healed wound in Tulio's life and causes him to exclaim, what a tragic thing is slavery. These passionate descriptions from Tulio and Susanna of all they've lost are wrenching for readers who see in Susanna's account, likely for the first time, literary descriptions of a slave's prior life, her homeland and her experiences before coming to Brazil. This reminds readers that slaves are not called into being when they step off the boat in the Americas, that many had full lives before being snatched from their homes and to support an abject institution. In these moving descriptions, readers are forcefully, albeit not explicitly, pushed to imagine their own family relationships and how it would feel if those were suddenly severed by slavery's chains. The narrator of Uncle Tom's Cabin goes even further when she comments on Eliza's decision to escape with her young son, Harry, a few hours before he's to be sold by the ostensibly kind Master Shelby to settle a debt. And this is one of the most famous passages where you know, she, she, runs, she crosses the ice on the Ohio River to escape to freedom in Canada. Uh, the narrator, though, she asks readers to imagine them in, themselves in Eliza's situation and to think about how fast they could run and how far they could get to protect their children. The summons for readers, particularly female readers, to place themselves in Eliza's shoes is unmistakably clear. In a question that simultaneously emphasizes little Harry's innocence and equates Eliza's motherly devotion with readers' love for their own children. And this kind of love, that, that this kind of love, uh, or rather this appeal was effective is corroborated by uh, the scholar Brian Yothers who cites a letter written by a reader of Uncle Tom's Cabin that claims the story was peculiarly calculated to enlist the moral and religious sympathies and to call to action the latent energies of the female heart. And um, surely this, the narrator's appeals to motherly love and the suffering of innocent children are, are part of what this reader is referring to uh, in his or her letter. Uh, the main character, Tom, is also ripped from his family, from his family in the novel. I don't have time to go into to, uh, his story here, but he's shown to be every bit as devoted to his family as the readers are to their own. Um, constructing Francisco, Tom, Susana, and Tulio in this way has an emotional impact on the readers. As Claudette Williams explains, if one of the effects of pro-slavery discourse was to normalize the view of slaves as non-human, Suarez, and I'm gonna add the others here, respond in their novels by naturalizing their humanity. Rather than painting them as violent and rebellious slaves, Hayes, Suarez y Romero, and Stowe depict their characters as innocent and meek, which facilitates readers feeling empathy as they witness the unjust suffering inflicted upon them. These descriptions impress on readers the gentle and loyal nature of these slaves. While this increases their indignation upon seeing them suffer at the hands of the slaveholders, uh, it also seems calculated to reassure readers that ending slavery will not result in a violent overthrow of the prevailing social order. In keeping with that order, based largely on the family unit, these texts portray enslaved characters' subjectivity and capacity for loving family relationships, deepening the horror readers are called upon to feel when viewing the breakup of those family units. This presentation has only been a partial treatment of the issues in question, but I've endeavored to show the potential of these abolitionist novels in reshaping the attitudes and beliefs of readers, whether in the 19th century or now. As Lynn Hunt puts it, any account of historical change must in the end account for the alteration of individual minds. For human rights to become self-evident, ordinary people had to have new understandings that came from new kinds of feelings. Though it would be a mistake to view these books as a panacea for slavery or racial injustice, they had and have the potential to significantly shift readers' attitudes about these important issues. In a summary of the, of the introduction to a 2007 edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Ronald Briggs states that the use of sentiment was a pedagogical technique necessary for a readership obstructed by a web of prejudice and social taboos. Analyzing books such as those by Hayes, Suarez y Romero, and Stowe can be very useful for us today since it helps us to think about how fiction is situated in reality and how it succeeds by pulling readers into a process of involvement in the narrative, reframing their views of the world and their relationships to those around them. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, Jordan, for letting us explore these um, uh, three three novels, 19th century novels. Um, I've already like many questions for you. Um, I would like step back for the moment and and let um, Benjamin present. Okay, so, Benjamin. Great. Are you ready? I am ready. Yes. Great. So thank you so much. Um, and then um, we are happy to now hear your presentation. Yes, let me just share my screen. So this is coming from my, uh, this research is coming from my master's thesis, which I am currently finishing up this semester. And so the kind of the framing of my work has changed ever so slightly. Oops. Um, so I'll be focusing less on the state and multiculturalism, but more on identity that is performed in indigenous language hip hop. Um, and so I have retitled my presentation, Rap Order Hinario, Identity Activism in Indigenous Language Hip Hop. Um, to begin, I'm just going to start by playing a video just to contextualize what I'll be talking about so you can see and hear where, where I'm going. <laughs> So I would love to keep listening, but for the sake of time, we're going to uh, we're going to move on. <laughs> um, so that was Pat Boy Maya Rap. Pat Boy Rap Ich Maya is his rap name. Uh, he's from Jose Felipe Carrillo Puerto, which is here in Quintana Roo, Mexico. The other two artists who I'll be talking about today, mainly who who are informing my presentation, among others, are Zara Manroy, who is from the Comcac Nation, also sometimes known as Seri, um, in Sonora, from Puente Chueca, and Juneva, whose name translates to Atreve, uh, through the wind. Basically, he wants his message to be delivered through the wind to other people. And so he speaks Cuicateco, and he's from Santa Maria Popolo, which is in Oaxaca. Now, there are a lot of different artists all across Mexico, but I think that these artists highlight some of the main points I'm talking about today and represent, you know, a geographic and gender diversity as well within the movement. So I'm just going to give a brief history of uh, how hip hop came to Mexico. Hip hop began in the 1970s in the Bronx, New York, as a way for black and brown people to express themselves and their their resistance to various forces of oppression, oppression, oppression um, namely racism. Hip hop culture is often said to be made up of four practices, which are rapping, DJing, breakdancing, and graffiti. But this is a pretty limiting framework, um, as one one uh, hip hop practitioner, Africa Bambata, has described it. Hip hop is a lifestyle, it is an array of cultural practices. And so he added the ideas of knowledge, a certain kind of street knowledge and understanding and orientation towards um, towards resisting oppression uh, to what it means to be a hip hop artist. Um, and this has just expanded even further to include, you know, the fashion, the media and record industry, all of the fans who make hip hop hip hop. Um, so that's just kind of a framework for understanding what hip hop is. Now, hip hop came to Mexico um, in the 90s through various forms of media and deportation. So through MTV, radio and other kinds of music sharing services, people were able to listen to hip hop and all of my and the three artists I'm talking to today all mentioned that hip hop in some way. Um, that hip, they were inspired by artists, other artists from the United States and from Mexico in some way. Um, the other way that hip hop came to Mexico is through, through deported immigrants in the United States, mainly Chicano artists who brought back either little physical CDs with hip hop music on it, or brought back the knowledge and the understanding of how to do it and, and created their own cult hip hop cultures in Mexico. So hip hop is now spread into be kind of a, a global set of cultures, which is at once global and local. So it draws on this 
history of black resistance that has been kind of disseminated across the world, but it always maps onto individual circumstances and individual languages, rhythms, places, and people. So this is kind of the story of rap originario. Um, rap originario is characterized by rapping in indigenous languages. Performers often wear various traditional garments or fashion that um, relates to their, their particular identity. Um, and what they're really concerned with is expressing an identity that is not the essentialized and uh, static identity that's promoted by the say the state. They are also concerned with getting more people to speak the language and because of pop hip hop's global popularity, um, more kids, they think that more kids will be interested in learning, learning an indigenous language as a result of um, hearing, hearing the indigenous language in, in something like hip hop. So I'm gonna share another short part of a video uh, by Yuneva, this one's called Mi Lengua. Um, and yeah, we'll just listen to that real quickly. No. And you're, you're muted still. So we, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> A classic Zoom mistake. Um, so in this video, we saw Yuneva talking about um, talking about his connection to his grandparents and his community through language. He said, I speak the language of my grandparents. They taught me. And he expresses a real concern for the, the loss of language. Um, here he's performing his identity as an indigenous person through his connection to a linguistic community, but also through showing himself in his home in various parts of his town and the surrounding areas. Um, and he positions himself further as an activist, or he calls himself a promoter of the Kwikateka language. These are themes that are that are consistent throughout uh, many indigenous hip hop artists in Mexico and, and, and abroad. Um, but there are also more themes that tend to occur, uh, which which go beyond this kind of ide definition of indigenous identity that is about like cult traditional culture and language. Um, so Univa stressed to me that he wants to write more music like Bad Bunny. He wants to write about his life and about his relationships and about his his experience at university. Um, Pat Boy too has a number of songs that take on a ballad hip hop mix and, and talk about his relationships. So I'm gonna talk a bit about Zara Manroy now. She, uh, as I said, is from the Sericom Kak Nation in Puente Chueca. Um, she performs in what she says is her sacred and festive gar uh, vestments from her community that are worn at various festivals throughout the year. Um, they're often made from local fibers, materials and dyes. Um, the face paint that you see her wearing is uh, more a daily and makeup kind of kind of uh, addition. It's an everyday practice, and it is also made from you know local dyes and local source materials. So this is kind of a performative ident performative notion of indigenous identity. She wears when she wears this vestment, she situates herself as being traditionally seri. But more importantly, but importantly, she also wraps in this garment and presents what is traditionally Seri uh, as a part of this modern global force of hip hop. She thus redefines Seri identity as being from being a folklore to an active part of this global world. This is true too for language, as I mentioned earlier, as it enters the poetic form of rap. Zara says that her songs are mainly about the earth, fire, water, and wind, the four elements but indirectly brings attention also to the loss of language and the damages of extractive mining near her territory. And so here she's really setting herself up as an activist, as someone who's steady, as someone who's engaged, and as someone who's engaged in a larger global hip hop culture. And this is just another uh, example of some, some fashion in, in hip hop. This is Pat Boy's latest merch. Uh, it's, a song, it's a shirt that says Nuestra Región Maya. ADN Maya is the name of a collective he started for, for people who want to start rapping in Maya, who, who want to learn. 
um, and the image you see on it is is his house, is a thatched roof house um, traditionally found in, in in where he lives. So here he brings that image to like a globally circulating object, this T-shirt and a and a book of CDs, um, and again situates Yucatec Maya indigeneity not as a simply local and past experience, but as something that is currently happening, is evolving, and is global. Now. Rapo Reginario happens a lot online, especially during the uh, the past year because of COVID-19. Um, so rappers build communities and fan bases in order to spread their message further. In doing so, they also create an ever-changing avatar of the indigenous rapper that allows access into different spaces. The first thing I want to talk about, which I've shown here, is translations, because translations are extremely important. Um, Papoy said that he wants to add his songs add translations to his songs that people know what he's talking about. But he also said that, quote, in reality, there are very few times when the translations between Yucatec Maya and Spanish are the same. I try to keep them the same feeling, but also have the same rhyming and flow. And so as you can see here, what Papo is trying to do is to, is to not only situate himself as an indigenous person, but as a good rapper, as someone who can fulfill all the poetic requirements of writing a good rap verse. Um, I've tried to keep some kind of poetic and poetic form in my in my translations in this in this version of a song called uh, Vidas Mayas, but um, I am not as gifted as a lyricist as Pat Boy, so take that for what you will. <laughs> now Zara almost never releases her lyrics. Um, she she always just says something along the lines of this post on on uh, YouTube, where she said there isn't any translation. Just feel the vibration of the song and guide yourself by the heart, by how you feel. Um, and this is this is an interesting way of doing kind of the same work that Papoy was doing. It's not exa exactly what she is saying, but she's trying to tell you what she's talking about so that you can you can relate to the message in some way. Um, there's also a history of MCs who they, they lead shows, they're masters of ceremonies uh, as well as rapping. And so there's is very often that there's a, a a short introduction to a song or a brief kind of poetic speech before the rapping starts that explains what the song will be about. And so these kinds of translations or, or um, descriptions of the song fit into that, that poetic format of, of, hip, of a hip hop performance. Beyond the music videos, social media is an extremely important aspect of, uh, of rapper Hinayo artistry. Um, Uneva told me that his posts online are twofold. He uses them to give context and information about who he is, where he's from, and his daily life. And also he uses them to popularize himself because he doesn't have the economic resources to launch huge funding campaigns that, would, uh, that, a normal, that an artist might normally use. Um, so this is a useful kind of way of thinking about social media as constantly making and circulating specific images of identity that popularize the activism that these artists are trying to do. So here's some examples of that. Yuneva hosts a podcast where he discusses a number of issues related to indigeneity, indigenous activism. This one is an ad where he posted with the producer and anthropologist Mente Negra to talk specifically about rap originario. Mente Negra wrote kind of the first, kind of coined the term rap originario within academia, um, working on rap originario in Mexico City. Uh, this next post is kind of a contrast to that where he just talks about one of his favorite spots at his university, the University of Chapingo. Um, he describes why he likes it, the, the, the hakanda trees, the, the flowers, and then he even gives you a, a word for flower, nanda, in Kutetako. So he follows this with a huge line of hashtags, his name, rap originario, lengua originario, Mexi grammars, IGers, Mexico, and a whole nother list where it gets into being a rapper. Um, and so he's really tagging himself as a certain kind of person, as, a, as an indigenous person, as an originary person, um, as someone who's been to a university, as someone who raps, as someone who likes Instagram. And it really expands the definitions of indigenous identity beyond the notions of culture and language. Now, social media is also used to advertise events, as I mentioned. So here's Papo's event with Contigo en la Distancia, a government program started during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is supposed to bring live performances and access to libraries and archives about culture to the general public. 
Um, in this, Pablo gave a talk about finding flow in Yucatec Maya and talked about his journey into, into hip hop. And this is just a similar, uh, a similar advertisement that Zara Manroy showed, um, where she rapped again at Conti con la Distancia, a different festival. And this was just more of a, a typical concert where she would perform a few songs, say a few words, perform another few songs. Finally, artists organize with other rappers and activists outside of Mexico. This image on the left is an advertisement for a meeting of rapper Hinayo practitioners across Abya Yala, who they refer to as Latin America. Um, Abya Yala, which is referred, yeah, Latin America. As this event and artists discuss the various festivals that were occurring at the time and places, they also discuss the issues that each community faces in that moment. And then they share a few songs with each other. Um, so in that, there's a real kind of negotiation of indigenous identity, but also in understanding of community across national and state boundaries um, and a discussion of the ways that they might be able to better their communities and draw from each other. On the right, you see the image for a project by Mente Negra, the, the anthropologist and DJ, and Bandur, who is another uh, musician and anthropologist from Argentina. Um, they call it a rap documental, and it's a project called Conexión Originaria. It's a documentary um, explicitly done through hip hop. Each chapter features a number of artists that cross state borders and focus on some kind of theme. These, these projects weave together indigenous communities locally and globally in, in expressions of resistance to nation state and continued colonial violence. Both these ads show the kind of connection of a pan-indigenous solidarity. Again, events are advertised so that people can learn about indigenous movements. Again, I've been to both these events and many other people attended, talked, and in the comments there's lots of talk about how these, about how people outside of these movements can help. Um, and also the idea of an indigenous rapper becomes embedded in these global social movements. So what it means to be indigenous is actually redefined through, through these kind of circulations of these images and these advertisements. To conclude, Rapper Hinayo breaks, breaks the conception of indigenous identity that is folklorized or essentialized, something that is of the past and is kind of all of the same. Rappers highlight culture and language as important aspects of life but also highlight their quotidian lives as well, creating a dynamic understanding of indigenous identity that breaks these bounds. The medium of hip hop signifies indigenous traditions as being both local and global at the same time. And this happens through the circulation of this image of the rapper. The image of the rapper picks up new meanings and dimensions as it enters into new spaces through recorded virtual performances and meetings, as well as social media posts. And artists will constantly respond and talk to the fans that comment on these posts. All of these things destabilize the essentialist, folklorized, and static understandings of indigenous identity that are often promoted by the state, and as such operates as the basis of their activism, uh, of their language activism that they carry out. I'm going to post all of the, uh, all of the links to their social media in the chat, hopefully, so everyone can go and follow them, because that was the number one thing that they said I could do to help. Um, and so, yes, thank you everybody so much. Okay, thanks a lot, Benjamin. This was very, very impressive. And thanks also for letting us like engage with these, with these, with these groups and with their requests uh, by sharing with us the links. Um, so we are happy now to open the discussion. You can use the Q and A for. Um, to submit your questions to Jordan and, and Benjamin. Let me see. I believe that there is already a question coming up. Um, yes, there is a question for Ben asked by Argenis. I'm sorry if I mispronounce. Uh, Hurtado Moreno. You brought an important concern about translation work, the potential loss of, or, or alteration of meaning. Because you have access to your interlocutors, have you sought to collaborate with them to translate their lyrics? Is this something they are interested in? If so, how would you approach such work? Like, would you be like, are they open to translation? And would you be like a good translator from these many indigenous language 
into English, I guess, or Spanish or both, or even Portuguese or other languages from the region? Yeah, this is a very fascinating question. So all of the uh, all of the translations from an indigenous language into Spanish are done by the artists themselves. And so that's I have, I have taken from that. Um, I am open. I really want to collaborate with these artists on doing these translations. I talked a bit with Pat Boy when I was doing the translation that I put up on the screen for Vidas Mayas, because there was one, and this was actually a really interesting kind of ethnographic moment that happened uh, over, over, <laughs> over the internet, which is interesting enough. Um, but uh, there was a there was a part that said desquitando carapesa, which I was carapeso, which I was kind of like unsure about what he meant. And he told me that where he lives on the Ejido, there are taxations on various forms of on agricultural products such as corn. And so this was basically his way of saying, you know, we fight, we work hard every day so that we can earn the living, even though it is like taken from us. Um, and so that like influenced my my decision to write it as fighting for every peso rather than like struggling for every peso or or you know some other verb there because those these small changes can ha can have a big shift in the meaning of the song when it's when there's it's when it's poetry right when there's when there's such a uh, small amount of information so that's just one example um i know zada is pretty particular about not translating her music and that's also something I have to respect. She wants us to understand music as vibrations and as something that we can feel and be guided by, even if we don't necessarily know the, the referential meaning of, a, of what she's saying. Um, and so that's another kind of important boundary to, to, to negotiate and to understand. So it's very interesting also to you both, Benjamin and Jordan. Okay, you're also both like, experiencing as part of your work, your like research ethnographic work translation, also as a way to, in the case of Benjamin, like spread somehow these, um, these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, this music. In the case of Jordan, like, so, like at least with us in sort of close reading analysis of the text that you're bringing, uh, bringing here. Um, let me see, I think I have many questions, but let's see. Um, Okay, there are questions from uh, Tess Ranker, Carlos Ramirez, and Jessica Lena Weaver. Hi, Jessa. Um, so shall I, con I will quickly continue with Benjamin Jordan. What do you think? Um, so Benjamin, uh, Tess, uh, who is also a graduate student in Hispanic studies and our affiliate, she's asking uh, whether raptors you work with express any explicit intention to dialogue with black rappers and artists from the US and or contemporary anti-racist movements such as Black Lives Matter? If you're aware of any connection between them and these movements. Yeah, so um, with these three that I talked about today, I haven't heard any explicit connection besides the fact that they listen to a lot of music from the United States and um, Black rappers are are influenced by the cultural pol the cultural and racial politics of the United States. If they're in the United States, um, there is an, a rapper that I follow named Mare Avertencia Lirica, who is probably one of the more well known artists in Mexico for rap originario. And she, I've seen a lot of posts on her social media about how uh, a, a kind of in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, like. Um, and so whether or not they're actually going to work together, I'm, I'm not sure, but there's certainly an understanding or like a, a, a if not conscious and direct dialogue, a, a dialoguing of the ideas of, of, of the activism that's happening in the United States and how that gets transferred over into Mexico through, um, through music. Uh, the specifics of that is, is something that I, I actually do want to look into further in the future. Thank you so much. So now, uh, Jessa from the Anthropology Department, Professor of the, and Chair of the Anthropology Department and previous Director of our Center is asking, see, she's saying, I was struck by the first video you shared, the scenes of everyday life there, like the restaurant, the market, the bored kids with phones. So comparing that to the second video with urban scenes, plus also what looked like a petroglyph. I'm wondering if the artists spoke to you at all about the choices they made in the videos and how those choices connect to their linguistic activism. Yeah, so um, 
they they both those videos were they have like um like behind the scenes like making of the video um and they wanted to choose places that were important to them important to like what they thought of, of as their location um and also like the first one which was pack boys de gusta um he wanted to show his community specifically like the people he was around um and so when thinking about language, language is, is, is a connection to community and a connection to place. Lots of lots of words in, in indigenous language have to like draw directly from from what, what we might call like natural things like word, like the water or the earth or something. And so showing these places as being connected to language is I think an important part of their language activism. Um, they didn't tell me directly anything like we chose this scene or we chose this like this image to represent something um, more that they're just kind of constellations of images and people and places that they see as part of their everyday lives. Um, and that just happened to be put into that one video. That's how I understand it right now. And that's also another another point of, of future research. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Maybe we can uh, now discuss uh, some of the questions for Jordan and come back and forth. Uh, Jordan, I have at the moment a question from Carlos Ramirez, who is asking um, if you could speak more specifically about the idea of conveying feelings in readers of these works, more specifically, in order to avoid being anachronistic, what is the methodology you used in order to interpret the elicitation of feelings in 19th century public? This was also a question that I had, right? How you measure, right? this emotional reaction of readers, particularly going back to the 19th century, like to what kind of archives or, I don't know, maybe journals in which these novels were maybe originally published. So how do you, how do, you do? Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you, Carlos and Erika. Um, in terms of, I'll answer the first question, uh, Carlos's question in terms of the methodology as I mentioned in, in the presentation, I'm leaning a lot on affect theory and reader response theory. And the basic approach that I take is what would the reader, a 19th century reader be bringing to the text? What would their values be? What would be important to them? What would their fears be? I'm thinking of you know the Haitian revolution that happened around the turn of the 19th century. And certainly that was in people's minds uh, as people are advocating for the end of slavery, um, they're, you know, they're worried they're going to turn into the next Haiti, and of course they don't want to do that because they lose lose position and power. And so, trying to to get a sense for what those morals and values might be, uh, I mentioned a lot the focus on family and on there's a lot of Christian language appeals to. If you're a good Christian, you would do this, you would do this, you wouldn't do this and this. And so that's uh, how I'm trying to reconstruct what the reader experience might have been like in terms of Measuring that, um, I don't have a sort of scientific uh, study. Of course, I can't interview people from the 19th century. So what I'm relying on is, is archives, is newspaper reviews, letters to the editor. And the novel that's best documented is Uncle Tom's Cabin of the Three. Um, Ursula, there are some newspaper reviews that I've found. And Francisco was, as I mentioned, it was written in 1840, but because of censorship, it didn't get published in 1880, until 1880 in New York. And so uh, trying to find newspaper archives that deal with the, the reception of those, I have found some letters of the author of the Cuban novel who's sharing drafts with his friends and saying, what do you think? And, and they're talking about, okay, well, if you want this to impact the readers, or, or this passage has this impact on the readers, so keep it or make it more explicit or you know, giving advice in that. In that sense. And the last thing I'll say about being anachronistic or, or that potential is that Ursula in particular was published in 1859. It was moderately successful in the Northeast region, but uh, within not too long, it kind of faded from view and was recovered in the 1960s and has since become a very popular work. It's the first novel written by an Afro Brazilian woman. And it's increasingly cited and heralded by proponents of Afro-Brazilian identity and culture as a model, as a touchstone. And so I'm also looking at the contemporary readings and the, the discussions that are engaging with Ursula, even though, of course, slavery as an institution is gone. But how is it still uh, 
timely and present in our contemporary society. Great. Um, let me see if there is another question at the moment, not yet. So I would like to ask you then, I would like to ask you, Jordan. Um, so the three novels that you presented, right? They are they, the title of the three novels, right? And then the three cases are the name of the of the main characters. And um, uh, I also know some cases like in French Caribbean uh, novels related to fictional biographies of slaves, which we have like a similar pattern of using the name of the of the main slave character as the title of the novel. Um, so I would like you to talk a little bit about this maybe in terms of increasing maybe the level of subjectivity of the story, but also I was uh, wondering if you, you believe that somehow the this, this novel, like this sort of series of novel that you create by establishing the, the this comparison um, can uh, alleviate uh, somehow the lack of autobiographies of slaves that I think we 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 have, uh, particularly in the case I know of of Brazil, certainly of of, of Cuba and and the French Caribbean. So yeah, what yeah. is the relationship between reality and fiction? Given the fact that we don't have the... yeah, thank you, great question. Uh, I think Uncle Tom's Cabin and Francisco. You're right in that the the title of the work is the also the name of the main enslaved character. In the case of Ursula, Ursula is actually a white protagonist, and it's the slaves that are around her that are they're not they don't get as much screen time, shall we say, as the white characters. But but the construction of their subjectivity and giving them a name and giving them a history and a life before, uh, I think all of that, as you said, is an effort to increase their subjectivity. And in terms of pulling readers in the subtitle of uncle tom's cabin is or life among the lowly and i think it gives that impression of okay we're gonna engage with someone you've or with a, a side of life that you haven't seen like the implications of the reader is not lowly is not one of the enslaved and that they're going to be given this window into their experience and francisco the subtitle is um el ingenio o las delicias del campo which is an ironic title talking about how great life is on the plantation. And um, and, I, and again, I think that's a, a cue for the reader to say, hey, I'm gonna educate you about what life is actually like uh, for these enslaved characters. In terms of the lack of autobiographies, yes, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right in that these can be seen as filling in some of the gaps. Of course, the individual characters are, are fictional, but but the life, the events, as we know, are, are very real. Um, there's only one autobiography that I'm aware of uh, that was written by someone who was enslaved in Latin America, yeah. uh, which is actually translated by the author of Francisco, of this novel, uh, not translated, sorry, but, but edited. Um, and the, the language is cleaned up, shall we say. Um, and, and there's all sorts of political questions uh, that, that we could talk about in terms of that. The, there's one, account of a Brazilian, of a slave who experienced slavery in Brazil, which was written after he escaped in New York and then went to Canada and then went back to, anyway, there's a whole circuit, but it's written in English. Isn't he originally from Lebanon or something? No. I don't remember exactly where he's from uh, in Africa, but yeah, he, he, he was enslaved, taken to, to Brazil. And anyway, so there's no, extensive account written in Portuguese of what slavery was like. So absolutely, I think that Ursula can help stand in for the lack of, of autobiographical not, uh, narratives that we, we don't have. Erica, uh, yeah. there is a question on the chat from one of the panelists. Oh, because I just look at the Q&A, so. Yeah, if you're on a panelist, you can't access the Q&A, so it's on the chat. So, um, okay, it's Barufani who is asking the question. Jordan, I was fascinated by your presentation, specifically thinking about the idea or intention to look to literature to work towards empathy. I'm wondering how do we deal with 
how do we deal with the spectacular nature of black suffering, to paraphrase Saidia Atman, to deal with the contradictions of looking for empathy through stories of spectacular suffering, like tragedy, you said, like novels about slavery. So the paradox between empathy and the tragedy or what is recounting. Yeah, thank you, Watufani. This is a great question and something I've wrestled with uh, in terms of, I'm leaning on texts about human rights and social justice. There's, a, there's obviously, uh, and rightly so, a, a big discussion about how much do you tell, how graphic do you make these things, at what point does it become sort of a perverse enjoyment for the reader, uh, and at, at what point does it, when do you cross that line from, from inspiring empathy, or motivating them to align themselves with these characters versus have this voyeur position. And I'm not sure I've worked all of that out. I will say that in the novels that I look at, there are different levels of graphicness uh, in, in the violence. And so Francisco, for example, was extremely graphic in terms of the lashings, uh, rubbing salt and urine in his wounds. And there's descriptions over and over again of, of that suffering. Whereas in Ursula, the the physical suffering is not described. Of course, there's the emotional pain of being ripped from your family, which is huge, but there's not as intense of scenes of physical suffering. But there are cues from the narrator to say, you know, this slave, enslaved character, this black character uh, is locked in a room with a bunch of torture instruments. And how many slaves must have cried out in this room? And there's, there's explicit uh, questioning by the narrator in terms of that uh imagining and so i and and of course there's there's tony morrison who's very raw in her portrayals of slavery and so i, I don't know how to exactly approach it other than to study what the authors are doing and what i what effect i think that has on readers and, and relying in the case of contemporary novels um looking at people's comments on social media or on reviews or, or other things like that to see, did it go too far or not? Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, so I will have another question for Benjamin and then maybe go back to Jordan. I don't know how much time, Patsy, maybe you can tell me, can we go up to, 3.45 or? Yeah, that, that should be fine once um, Kate and Ilton agree to continue. Okay. We'll it should be fine. So, um, um, Benjamin, I was wondering about the performance that you uh, described, like Zara's performance, and but in particular, like the, the use, uh, her use of makeup, face paint, and festive garments. So I, based on what I know, um, like indigenous women over time across history are the ones who somehow have maintained more than men, the um, like uh, original fabrics, uh, textiles and, and clothes, right? And they also have built somehow their, um, um, their rights, uh, on uh, the fact of wearing like these specific uh, clothes. So in the case of um, hip hop artists like male, do you have any case of men uh, who are also using like traditional clothes or again, we are repeating the pattern of the men somehow removing the clothes and getting immediately more uh, a Western look during the performance? Yeah, so um, I guess there is like there, I would say that the, the clothing for the males is less based on traditional, although they sometimes wear like guaraches and the, um, the I'm forgetting the name of it now, the shirt, um, it'll come to me eventually. Um, but mostly what I've seen is, is rappers kind of taking symbols, um, glyphs or or other other kinds of imagery and kind of morphing them onto like the hip-hop style of like baggy pants t-shirts chains um i know like not this is in new mexico but in colombia there's a group called linaje originarios and they have these like decorative uh, neck pieces 
Um, that's kind of like like their indigenous bling is how they sometimes refer to it. Um, so for them, it's a lot more. Uh, there are, there are these instances of like engaging in like something that's like traditional clothing, um, but from what I've seen, it tends to be more of this kind of overlapping of, of symbols that they see outside of fashion or clothing necessarily, and kind of imprinting that onto the onto the format of, of hip hop of hip hop dress. So the adjective originario is an adjective that comes from them, from the reference to pueblos originarios, or is like an adjective that you are using to refer to this particular uh, rap. It comes. It comes from them. So they. There's kind of a, it, it's not necessarily a completely ubiquitous term. Most people use rap originario, but a lot of people also use rap indígena uh, also. So the way that they, at least Papoy and uh, Yuneva described to me that originario was, they pref they like the term originario because it, it represents this new understanding of indigenous identity where the term indígena kind of refers to the state marking this like old colonial category of being of being indigenous. Um, Papoy said that like it characterizes him as not him and the other the other Maya as not having any knowledge or not having any time. We heard you, Benjamin. Okay, maybe yes, lost the connection. We'll be back soon. Great. Uh, Benjamin? Yeah, I cannot. Hello, sorry, I think my, no my internet stopped. Um, I don't know where, where I was. No, we understand that the, the, like their preference for the adjective like originario better than indigenous for the references, like the colonial references that the, that the adjective indigenous contain, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's something that's uh, like, you know, Juneva, he's 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 impartial to it. He's like, yeah, I use both. I don't I don't really mind the term indigenous. Uh, Pat Boy was like, yeah, I don't really like. I'll use the term indigenous, but I don't like it. I, I prefer originario if I can use it. Um, and so this kind of contested answers to that, but th that's the general understanding. So to what extent is like um, is their music production really global, right? So we I understand that it is very much transnational within uh, within the Caribbean and Latin America as other like local uh, rap productions are. I know a little bit about the rap Mapuche uh, ones, like how global really these productions are? How far do they reach glo the global audience? And I don't yeah, know. Um, so in terms of the actual like sound and music that they make, a lot of it has to do with this kind of Latin American and Caribbean and obviously African diaspora traditions. Um, but so, you know, they, there's a lot of the beats that are kind of the underlying instruments of, of, of this music. Um, a lot of it comes from reggae, come from cumbia or from rock. So those are kind of the three other major genres that, that, they, that these artists draw on. Um, in terms of like performances, uh, I know Papoy has had a lot of interest from people in Germany um, and has a lot of conversation with like scholars and, and other researchers in, in Germany, um, just kind of as a happenstance of what social media gets circulated to which places. Um, he's also done a number, he also did an event a few weeks ago that was, spawn that was a, um, sponsored by like an Australian aid organization as well, um, which was interesting because it was about Yucatec Maya rapping and about like preserving indigenous languages. Um, and this was just kind of a one in a series of like, it kind of intersected with the, a series in Australia about indigenous language preservation. This, the, the, the group was called Australian Aid. Um, and so there's like every, I feel like every, every few months I see something new that like just adds a new place to the map um, of, of where, where, these, where these artists are being seen and heard and where their influences are, are coming from. Fantastic. Great. Um, so I have another question. Maybe we can, unless there are other um, potential questions coming up for Jordan. I was wondering, just out of curiosity, I was wondering whether this, the three novels that you are mentioning, first of all, if they are like the, the core corpus of your dissertation or if they're also 
like additional um, novels and if they are still like read today and translated maybe into which languages? Yeah, that's a great question. In terms of the, well, I'll start with Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was translated almost immediately into a lot of languages and circulated a lot. That is still read today. The reading of it is not nearly as generous. Well, I don't know if that's if that's accurate to say. There, there's been a lot of controversy. There always was. Um, right after it was published in the 1850s, there was a series of novels published about the how, how great slavery was. Uh, there's a whole slew of novels called anti-Tom literature. And so it's always been controversial. Uh, the character, the presentation of the characters, as I alluded to a little bit in my talk, it portrays them as suffering innocently, but it also portrays them as meek, as submissive, and a lot of, uh, especially black readers have taken issue with that and saying, uh, he's basically, he's not subjective enough. He doesn't, he's not independent enough. And, um, and so that's still, still a, a topic of debate. In terms of Francisco, um, it, as I, as I mentioned, it was published in the 1880s in New York. And I don't know, I don't have a lot of information about how much it's read today uh, by, by native Spanish speakers or uh, I'm not aware of a translation of it. Ursula is, as I said, being read more and more in Brazil and in Brazilian circles. And there's a translation of it into English actually set to be released this year. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's still buzz about them. They are the core corpus of my first chapter, which is about the 19th century. My second and third chapters focus on contemporary novels with the same kinds of questions, but with different issues. Uh, so race as a legacy of slavery and, uh, and issues of displacement. So people living on the periphery of society, people living in the favela communities and that kind of thing. So similar approach in terms of affect theory and reader response theory, the narrative techniques, but uh, you know, more contemporary issues. So somehow you're going to connect like these three, this, this, three, this constellation of three novels, mm -hmm. Right, with contemporary uh, literature in Brazil on uh, favelas and social inequality. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and one of the primary differences being, whereas in the 19th century, lots of the abolitionist novels were written by white authors who, were, who had never experienced slavery, who weren't really speaking from, a, from personal experience, uh, the contemporary novels are, that I'm looking at are written from primarily the perspective of those who live in those communities, if that makes I'm sense. I'm not looking at like, let's say, I mean, I know that from Uncle Tom's, that there are like uh, several like cinematic interpretations. You're not looking at also um, films based it's, on- No, I'm not, I'm not looking exclusively at films. It's, it's there in the background, but it's not the focus. My, my focus is more on prose, on novels. Yeah, and thanks so much for your close reading and for bringing this, this text to our knowledge. Sure, thank in, you. In English. Um, great, so it's 3.43, uh, maybe if you agree, we can, uh, we can just say goodbye uh, here and thank again everyone who participated in this panel, the panelists first, their advisors, Leila Lennon, I guess just like Elena Weaver, who, uh, who joined us today. Uh, I can see some of the names of our colleague. Jerry Augusto is also here with us. And then uh, um, also like um, other graduate students from the different departments. Um, thanks so much, Kate, Eilton, Ellen White for organizing all the technology around the event and our center director, Patsy Lewis for bringing everyone together uh, today and make this event possible this year as well behind the, or beyond beyond the circumstances can i just thank you erica and jill for your wonderful work sharing the panels and um i add my thanks to everybody that you've mentioned but i had one huge omission in my original comments this morning i wanted to thank alexandria miller 
one of our graduate students who was central to reaching out to the rest of you and for organizing this. So thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, everybody else. And I really enjoy these presentations and look forward to our next graduate student um, symposium. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye.